Good evening, everybody. Welcome to AMSI Web Series Season Three. I request all participants kindly mute your audio and stop your video. Request all participants kindly mute your audio and stop your video. We have Dr. Gary with us today. Pravin, over to you. Pravin. Good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to uh, uh, introduce the co-hosts of the day. We have YouTube co-hosts. Uh, first, Dr. Arun Kumar from Chennai. Dr. Arun Kumar, do you want to say hello? Yeah. Hi. Hi. Uh, Dr. Uh, Sony Pulan from Cochin. Dr. Sony. Hi. Hi. Dr. Darpan Bhagwa from Bhopal. Hi, Dr. Darpan. Hi, you sir. Hi. Hi, everyone. Then we have uh, Zoom co-hosts. Uh, we have uh, Brigadier S K Roy Chaudhary. Sir, do you want to say hi? Hey, good evening, everybody. Then Dr. Vishal Bansal from Subharthi uh, Dental uh, College. Dr. Vishal. Hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to join the icon of the. in the field of pjr and sharing the uh, screen with them hello thank everyone you. thank you vishal so i would request dr pramod to uh, take over uh thanks amit it's a pleasure to welcome everyone on behalf of the association of oral and maxillary facial surgeons of india so a uh, special uh, greetings joining us uh, on behalf of the american tnj surgeon society and on behalf of the european uh, tmj society i would like to thank uh, dr neelam andrade the president of indian uh, tmj surgeon society for agreeing to collaborate with us and uh, i wish to acknowledge the presence of dr nehal patel who is the uh, secretary of indian uh, tmj surgeon society dr nehal hi 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 everyone hi everyone it's a great uh, yeah. uh, thing to be collaborating estm days and estm days with the home sign thanks ramon yeah thanks thanks nehal uh, i wish to thank uh, dr joseph mckain president uh, uh, american tmj surgeon society for uh, collaborating with us and uh, wish to thank gary for uh, 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 helping us to uh, collaborate with the ASTMJs as well. I also wish to thank uh, uh, Andrew Sidebottom for uh, uh, facilitating the collaboration with ASTMJs. Special thanks to Paula for sending out uh, all those emails. Now, uh, Gary and I go way, uh, way uh, a long way back uh, when we started uh, doing arthroscopy on. pick uh, specimens a uh, long time back but gary has now become a, a pillar of uh, training uh, in the field of training of tmj surgery including arthroscopy and uh, joint replacement uh, and he is known for the uh, tmj mini residency course that he runs uh, in his own country and he comes here uh, to help me with the amrutha tmj course as well Gary, thanks a lot for uh, taking your time out, and uh, I hand over the uh, uh, the screen to you. Uh, I'm sure you're going to introduce your other panelists as well. Yes, thanks, Pramod. Let me just get my screen here. Can everybody see that screen? Yeah, it's perfect. Great. <clears throat> okay, so 
Good day to you all. Um, I'm choosing those words carefully because we've got uh, people logging in from all different time zones around the world. And uh, I hope that you, your families and friends are safe and well in these difficult times. Um, first of all, I thank the organizing committee for the very kind invitation to moderate this webinar. This is actually the first collaboration between AOMSI, ISTMJS, ASTMJS, and ESTMJS. And it's a true honor for me to participate. So we'll be talking this morning or this evening <clears throat> uh, about alloplastic total joint reconstruction of the TMJ. And I put this slide up here because this is, this is for John Shanley. And he's actually from my hometown, originally from um, Bury, which is just outside Manchester in the United Kingdom. But he was a pioneer of the total hip arthroplasty and his research and clinical work really changed the practice of orthopedics. And this is one quote that he made many, many years ago, the practice of modern day orthopedic surgery would be unthinkable without alloplastic devices. And I think nowadays the same is true of the temporomandibular joint, given that alloplastic devices have uh, become so reliable and have good outcomes. So we've assembled, so let's get this slide to advance here. Um, we've assembled a panel of extremely well-known and experienced TMJ surgeons from around the world. So I'd like to spend a few minutes just introducing each one of them. Uh, but before I do that, I want to sincerely thank them for giving their time and agreeing to participate and be panelists for me on this session. First of all, we'll do this in the order that these panelists will be presenting cases. Abe Kamath is clinical professor and chief of oral maxillofacial surgery at Kasturba Medical College Hospital in Mangalore, India. Andrew Sidebottom is consultant in OMS in Nottingham University Hospital in the UK. He's a member of ESTMGS. He's patron along with me uh, of ISTMGS. Lou McCurry, I think uh, I consider Lou honestly to be one of the two godfathers of alloplastic TMJ replacement, probably him along with Peter Quinn. Uh, so it's a true honor to have him on board and supporting this. Uh, Lou is with the Department of Orthopedic Surgery at Rush University, and he's also clinical consultant along with me for uh, TMJ Concepts in Ventura, California. Luke Cascarini uh, is a consultant oral maxillofacial surgeon at Guy's and St. Thomas's Hospital, and he is a member of ESTMJS. So the format of today's webinar is case presentations by each panelist uh, with an emphasis on discussion around each case. And this slide lists the uh, seven cases that hopefully we'll get through over the next two and a half hours. So let's jump right in and I'll hand over at this point to Abe and uh, he can start with presenting case one. Thank you, Gary. I'm sure I'm audible to everyone. Uh, the slide changing will be done by... Me, the slide do changing? That. You'll do, do that? that? Yeah, yep. thanks Gary, thank you so much. Uh, it's an honor to be a part of this AOMSI webinar series on total TMJ reconstruction. Uh, as Gary spoke about Sir John Charlie giving up, uh, giving away the TMJ uh, joint replacement concept from the orthopedic literature. Even before I start my presentation, two things which I would like to make clear is I consider temporomandibular joint reconstruction as a holy grail to the maxillofacial surgeon. And we need to remember when we speak about TMJ reconstruction, you need to have the end result in mind. So what I mean to say is have your goals of TMJ reconstruction very clear. The most important goal being improve mandibular form and function, reduce the patient's suffering and disability and contain excessive treatment costs and prevent morbidity. With this, or with these few words, I go on to the case presentation. Here you see a 34-year-old man who presented to us with history of bilateral condylar trauma two years ago, and he was treated conservatively with maxillomandibular fixation or MMF, and now has presented to us with reduced mouth opening. Those are the scans which clearly depict 
the ankylotic mass, the mouth opening, as well as the OPG or the orthopantomogram, clearly depicting the amount of extra articular ankylosis, which is clearly visible there on the axial CT scan. Gary? Okay. So, Abey, thank you for that uh, introduction. Um, so, here the options for treatment are either autogenous or alloplastic. Can you explain why you chose an alloplastic uh, device for this particular case? Uh, if I have to summarize, two things. All reconstruction options which are available nowadays or which were available previously, when you consider a case of PMJ ankylosis, which is seen in a patient who has, uh, who's quite old without facial asymmetry, would go undergo the same regular treatment options. It might be gap arthroplasty or interpositional arthroplasty, or to restore the vertical dimension, you can also settle in for a vertical ramus or an L osteotomy, or release the ankylotic mass and then as a secondary chance going for a transport distraction. These are the options which are available for us. Now coming down to the question, why alloplastic reconstruction? Mainly because of the unpredictable nature of the autogenous grafts. And studies by Matthew in 2019 concluded that TMJ reconstruction with alloplastic material has more predictable outcomes. And of course, my esteemed panelist, Dr. Andrew Sidebottom in the British Association of Maxillofacial Surgeons clearly laid down guidelines for patients who require alloplastic reconstruction. That's the reason we went in for an alloplastic reconstruction. Okay, so can you comment on when you feel an alloplastic device, a stock alloplastic device is acceptable and when a custom joint is necessary? Uh, if you ask me, uh, an alloplastic device as when you classify it as a custom or a stock joint, if you're asking for the indications, probably an inflammatory arthritis involving the TMJ, or if there is recurrent or fibrous ankylosis, all this depends upon when we see the patient at the time of presentation, as well as when you see the scans. If you see the patient and get to understand that if there is distortion of the normal anatomy of the TMJ, you would, also, you would settle down for a custom made joint because in the stock joint here in India, we have the stock joint which is available and marketed by Biomet Microfixation. So we really don't have too much of an option to give to the patient. So we most of the time settle down for a stock joint. And when we settle for a stock joint, the most important thing from an Indian scenario, what I would do is I would go in for a stock with my planning in position or in place where I would go in and get an STL model done. And if the STL says that I am unable to put in a stock joint because of the distorted anatomy or the amount of available bone which is redundant in that particular area, I would go in for a custom made joint. And that's the reason possibly we are in a developing phase where we think that virtual surgical planning has a role to play here. Great, thank you. So I've had a couple of points here. The the stock device, the way that I think about this is it comes in sizes. You pick the yes. size, pick fits the patient the best, and then you're making the patient fit the prosthesis, exactly. by bone irregularities and so on. So I think to break down when an alloplastic stock device is appropriate or not, it boils down to the configuration and size of the defect that you're trying to reconstruct, number one. And then secondly, the geometry and configurations of the glenoid fossa, the lateral zygomatic process of the temporal bone, and the lateral ramus. Because you have to be able to get this device to fit and be stable, in other words, not mobile. So if you can accomplish those things and the size of the defect is appropriate, then I think an alloplastic device, stock device, is okay. Right. Otherwise, a, a custom device is absolutely necessary. Um, Abe, how do you go about sequencing the placement of this stock device in terms of uh, which one do you put in first? And then can you comment on when a coronoidectomy might be required? Uh, can we go on to the next slide? Uh, when I speak about uh, sequencing for a joint replacement, a stock joint replacement, 
an ideal option. Uh, okay, this is the STL model to be more precise for the crowd to understand. That's the STL model where we do our planning there. The STL model, as Gary spoke about, helps us to understand what size of the stock joint, the standard stock joint, will fit onto the lateral ramus of the mandible, as well as the fossa eminence processes, as to understand whether it's the small, medium, or large. The sizing depends mainly on the extension of the flange. These are the trial sizes or the templates which we use on the lateral ramus to understand how far below or above is the foot plate going to sit there. The mandibular or the condylar component, I would like to call it as the foot plate, and that's the fossa eminence processes. So this gives you a virtual reality as to what you can expect in the operating room and also cuts down on your surgical time. And uh, to enumerate the surgical steps or the sequencing, what Gary put across, uh, classically, when we started doing joints, this was in fact my first joint. And, uh, Going through the steps, we use the isolation maneuvers separately for the oral cavity, as well as separate instruments for the temporomandibular joint and the oral cavity. That's the offside what you see there. We, we approach this particular joint with a preauricular incision. There you see the exposure of the ankylotic mass and the retrieval of the ankylotic mass. But coming down or boiling down to the steps, ideally or classically speaking, it's the incisions which play a very important role where you go in with the preauricular as well as the retromandibular approach, you perform the osteotomy, whether it's a two-step osteotomy where you have the ankylotic mass out, where in the Indian scenario, you have huge blocks, a Sony's type four. So you do a piecemeal removal and retrieve the ankylotic mass, which is much more better seen on a CT scan, a coronal scan, which gives you an idea. If you have a leeway pathway, it's easier to retrieve the ankylotic mass. So you can do your osteotomy in two sets where you push the mandible from the bottom, do the second osteotomy. Once the osteotomy is done, then you prepare the fossa eminence prosthesis with the dedicated rasp, which has the same width of the fossa eminence prosthesis so that you have a tripod stability there. Once you've done that, once you've prepared the fossa eminence prosthesis, you're going for your occlusion. Once you've released, you get your occlusal placement right, and then you go in for the sizing and placement of the FEP. Once that is done, you go in and fix the mandibular component. Once the mandibular component is fixed initially with just two screws, which are 2.7 mm, you go back intraorally or the second team goes back intraorally, make sure there is no contamination from the preauricular to the intraorally. You have separate set of instruments there put the patient through the range of motions. And if you feel that there is any hindrance, then possibly going for a coronoidectomy. But from the Indian clinical scenario, what we have been taught of from yesteryears is, if you're planning a coronoidectomy at this particular stage, because of the long-standing scenario of the coronoid getting elongated, we normally do a coronoidectomy so that there is no mechanical obstruction. That's the reason we do a coronoidectomy from this particular scenario, but however, if the range of movements is hindered, then you possibly go in and do a coronoidectomy as well. Once you've done the coronoidectomy and you find that there is good adequate mouth opening, you go in and do your final fixation of your screws there and achieve a good closure and then a rehabilitation. There you see the temporomandibular joint prosthesis in place. Yes, Gary. Um, one additional indication for coronoidectomy, at least in my opinion, is if you're using the prosthesis to advance the mandible, right. unlike sagittal split osteotomy, where okay. the coronoid process doesn't move, if you're using the prosthesis, and you'll see a design later when uh, Dr. Mr. Sybottom presents on custom, um, the entire ramus moves forward. And if it's a significant mandibular advancement, then that coronoid can interfere with the posterior maxilla. That would be the second indication that I would add um, to you doing a coronoidectomy. Gary, would you go in for a coronoidectomy in all your cases, whether it's a simultaneous orthognathic and DMJ replacement? Can we have uh, Lou, Lou comment on this or Andrew comment on this? Uh, how would you take it? Other than TMJ and kylosis, if you're looking at any other condition involving the TMJ, is it mandatory that you go in for a coronoidectomy? No, I think you hit it on, on, on the head when you said if once you've released the joints, whether it's an ankylosis, bony or fibrous, and you go into oral and try and open the mouth, if you can't open the mouth and you've released the joints, then 
a coronoidectomy is indicated. That's indication one. The second one is with the mandibular advancement, okay. where the coronoid may impinge an impact on the posterior maxilla underneath the arch. Gary, could I add something? Sure. Um, I think the other indication, which again, my case doesn't illustrate, but may, is lengthening of the ramus. So with the ankylosis cases, particularly with those that have developed in childhood, which you see a lot of in India, you're wanting to lengthen the ramus to allow counterclockwise advancement. And that in itself is restricted by the temporalis pull and the coronoid. Excellent. That's right, thank you. Yeah, fantastic. Vey, would you like to come out on this slide and then we'll- Yeah, and uh, that's a peer view demonstrating the bilateral TN joints in place. You see there, you get your X-rays going, whether it's a CT scan or a peer view mandible, you want to fit, see the fit of your uh, stock processes, the angulation of the stock processes, how much the screw has bitten down into the ramus of the mandible, it's bicortical in origin, and you see a good fit there. And of course, the mouth opening post alloplastic TMJ reconstruction. So I think the key points with the stock devices is stability. You have to be able to get stability and that requires bone removal to avoid any rocking of the ramus and to get tripod stability at minimum for the fossa on the on the glenoid fossa and the skull base. Yari, can I comment on this at this time? Yes. Uh, do you go in and uh, graft the skull base if the, skull, if the glenoid fossa is deep? Would you like to graft that so that you get the good stability of the fossa eminence prosthesis? Because I've seen David, Dr. David Sutka from Toronto do that. If the glenoid fossa is really deep, he takes the same bone which has been removed, puts it against the glenoid fossa and then places the fossa eminence prosthesis. Any take on this from your side? My opinion on that is provided you can get tripod stability. In other okay. words, two points lateral, one point medial. Grafting isn't necessary and it will probably just introduce another variable that could potentially fail and become infected. Um, okay. What do the other panelists feel about grafting? Yeah, I, I would agree with you, Gary. I don't, I don't like putting grafts in there. They're um, non-vascularized and therefore there's an increased risk of infection and failure. Okay. So what, what you see often under the prosthesis, if you go back in down the line, when primarily you had a prosthesis where there was a gap, is that there's often bone grows into that gap and fills it. So rely on primary stability of the prosthesis and the body will adapt around it. Okay. Great. Abey, would you like to yeah. come on the slide and then we'll move on to case two. Yeah. This is an interesting slide. The reason why I put up is we're going into the case two scenario by Dr. Andrew side bottom. When we select joints for uh, stock joints or joints for custom alloplastic uh, reconstruction. The most important thing in these particular situations is planning. Of course, I bought, this is a slide which I borrowed from Dr. David, where it clearly depicts on the left side to the screen, you see that there is an angulation of the foot plate to that of the glenoid fossa, whereas on the right side, you see that the foot plate is sitting the right flush into the glenoid fossa. So this is what we have to consider. You need to understand the ramus fossa angulation where you drop a line across the glenoid fossa and drop a perpendicular on the lateral ramus, which will clearly shows or depict to understand if there is a lateral flare in the ramus of the mandible or if there is medialization of the glenoid fossa. If that's the case, you will have to go in and settle for an offset. Since offsets are not available for us, these are candidates who are ideal for an alloplastic custom made or a patient specific joint replacement and that's much more better seen if you're using an STL model or if you have computer-aided virtual surgical planning, this would be an ideal choice to understand the anatomy there because when you're considering an indication for your uh, stock joints, this planning maneuver comes into play. Thank you. So um, what I'd like to do is we'll take case two and then we'll have more discussion and invite questions from the viewers because I think the discussion and the questions will be common to both the stock versus custom device. So Andrew, would you like to take over and, uh, and explain case two? Yeah, thanks. Um, first of all, uh, just thank yous to the uh, Indian Association for organizing this and for Gary for putting in a lot of work to uh, make this flow smoothly. So what I'm going to show in the next case is really 
a few of the indications for custom prostheses. We're very lucky in the UK that the majority of prostheses we place are custom. Um, I probably do one stock case a year and the remaining 30 or 40 I would do would tend to be custom prostheses. Um, so the case I'd like to present is a 20 year old male with a five year gradual deterioration in his bite with development of an anterior open bite of three millimeters and an overjet of eight millimeters. Has a pain score over both joints of three out of 10, but he has a reasonably normal mouth opening, which I haven't noted there, of 38 millimeters. So this is the pictures of him. And you can see quite obviously he has hypoplasia of the mandible with retrusion of the chin and vertical shortening of the ramus and an increased overjet, increased overbite, uh, reduced overbite. Moving on to the next slide, the OPG shows clear lack of the condyles and confirmation of the anterior open bite with the cephalometric planning at the bottom and the lateral kef on the right side as you look at it. So next slide, please. And there's the cephalometric plan showing the measurements comparing normal with the patient. And you can see a markedly reduced SNB and an increased ANB with um, relatively normal facial height and relatively normal maxillary position. So moving on to the next slide. This is the 3D recon uh, scans. So just confirming what we can see clinically, which is loss of ramus height, chin retrusion, and clockwise rotation of the um, mandible. And you can see on the lower slides where the ID canal has been marked by the um, TMJ Concepts technicians so that we can appropriately plan where we're going to put the prosthesis. But the things that you need to be aware of when you're thinking of whether you do stock or custom are on the right of this slide. So there's inversion of the angle, which makes fitting a stock prosthesis difficult. There's flaring of the ramus, and there's a very thin ramus, which would make a provision of a sagittal split or osteotomy a difficult proposition. And I've certainly tried this on patients with similar conditions and had a bad split with a horizontal split because there are not two cortices, they're both fused. So next slide, please. So let's have a little bit of a talk. So Andrew and also the other panelists, and I'm sorry, Dr. McCurry was muted and couldn't unmute. So hopefully he's back in. Are you good now, Lou? Can you hear us and speak? Can you hear me? Yes, great. Apparently he couldn't Thank unmute. Um, so Andrew, this is a case of, of condylar resorption. How do you go about working through the differential diagnosis for a condylar resorption case? Is it inflammatory, primary inflammatory like rheumatoid? Is it the secondary degenerative osteoarthritis or is it uh, ICR, idiopathic condylar resorption? So this, this one is unusual in that it's a male and the majority of condylar resorption cases we tend to see a female, although I've got three male patients with condylar resorption. Um, this case again was very easy for me because the rheumatologist had already made a diagnosis of inflammatory arthritis in childhood. And we can see that there's been resorption of the condyle. But yeah, moving forward, the, the alternatives really when you see a case like this are to take a good history for rheumatoid disease. So it, are there any other joint involvements? Is there any other joint pain? Um, have they seen a rheumatologist? Have they had a rheumatological opinion? Um, secondly, um, inflammatory markers, routine rheumatoid serology, et cetera. And um, thirdly, um, any, any obvious other issues that we can see here. So has the patient had previous surgery, et cetera, which we can see uh, condor resorption following prior orthognathic surgery. Yeah, I think that's, that's absolutely right. Um, the rheumatologic workup, if you choose to do that yourself, might include rheumatoid factor, but only 80% of rheumatoid yeah. patients are positive for rheumatoid yeah. factor. Anticyclic citrullinated peptide is actually more helpful because it's a lot more specific. 
and has similar sensitivities and actually it's positive earlier in disease and often will uh, indicate a more severe form of rheumatoid arthritis like erosive osteoarthritis. Uh, HLA B27 is another one that looks at juvenile RA and uh, anti-nuclear antibody for SLE. Uh, and then if you're suspicious of uh, idiopathic condylar resorption, um, do you look at estrogen levels and vitamin D? I, I don't really. I mean, I very much uh, follow the Larry Walford school, is if you've got a patient with obvious condylar resorption, you need to treat that if it's an isolated joint. Um, and I haven't been convinced that using um, female hormones and um, anti-inflammatory drugs, DMARDs, et cetera, have the, the side effects of those drugs. And particularly when we're considering that at the time with COVID, when patients who are on these um, immune modulating drugs are three times more likely than patients with respiratory and cardiac pathology to get serious complications of COVID, I think we need to be very careful when we're talking about this for just a jaw. Yes, I agree. Any other comments from Lou, Luke, or Abe? Yeah. Can, can I make a comment? Sure. Um, I, I'm, thank you for the invitation. I'm sorry I, I got muted before. I don't know what happened. But anyway, um, I think it's important uh, to look at the, uh, the hormonal issues. Uh, there have been some really interesting papers that have just come out with some animal studies showing that low estrogen uh, does increase the potential for the development of, uh, of uh, condylar resorption, at least in, in animals. Um, I agree with Andrew that uh, the use of the Arnett uh, medication route uh, is not a reasonable uh, choice uh, for the reasons he stated, as well as the fact that some of these drugs, uh, the side effects are uh, lymphoma for the DMARDs. So um, I agree with everything Andrew said. I think um, this is a real indication for an alloplastic uh, custom prosthesis um, because these, these cases have such um, uh, abnormal and anatomical structure uh, and architecture. So I, I, I thank you for the opportunity to participate. Luke, any comments or obey? Good um, call. The question, sorry, uh, could I ask about um, sleep obstruction? Did, did the patient have any um, obstructive sleep problems? And do you ever use that as part of your workup for a case like this? Yeah, I think that's vitally important, Luke, and thanks for raising it. He didn't. He'd been referred from a, a distant hospital um, and been investigated there. But certainly it has a huge impact on post-operative management. And most of these patients will come to me. If they haven't had sleep studies, I will send them for that. Because if I don't, my anesthetist will chop me by the uh, whatevers. And uh, they will not be in this case until you've got sleep studies. Because the, the post-op care has to be in a high dependency unit rather than back on the ward. Most of my joint replacement cases go home the following day. The ones with sleep apnea will go home 48 hours but they will need close monitoring overnight in case of apneas. Thanks. So I would probably add one point uh, to follow on from what Dr. Mercury mentioned about ICR. Uh, there's two sides to this, the diagnostic side and then the treatment side. And I totally agree with Andrew and Lou um, that I don't use the aggressive RNAP treat, RNET treatment protocol. Um, however, I do test for estrogen if I've ruled out every other cause of condylar resorption and uh, estrogen levels may be low due to um, uh, birth control, uh, HRT, or ovarian failure, um, in which case then supplementing estrogen may help. As we know, estrogen is bone protective and condylar protective. So deficiencies can lead to potential condylar resorption. So let's move on if we can, Andrew. We'll carry on with the treatment options. Okay, well, the treatment options for this um, young man are do nothing. Obviously, he's got good mouth opening. He has reasonable function, but he has an anterior open bite and a progressive resorption of the condyle. But at the end of the day, we don't treat x-rays. So arthroscopy and pain control are a reasonable option. 
Sagittal split advancement is a possibility, but I've raised the issue with the thin ramus in these cases. And also in inflammatory arthritis, the patients tend to have a degree of osteoporosis. Bilat bilateral inverted L would need an interposition bone graft. And similarly, how stable is the bone in these cases? Uh, bilateral distraction, again, quite thin bone, but you, would, you could do this and plan it on 3D. But we know that there's evidence in patients with existing condyl resorption that they will get further resorption in about 50% of cases, um, according to Taylor Hoppen Rice's and subsequent studies, or bilateral alloplastic TMJ. And don't forget that we work normally in these patients with orthomethic problems closely with our orthodontic colleagues. And therefore, to get a stable occlusion post op, you need to be able to have study models to check if you've got a stable occlusion that could be achieved in the operating room. And therefore, the patients may or may not need orthodontics preoperatively. Yeah. And of course, some people would include costochondral graft as a reconstructive option as well. Um, I'd like to invite Dr. McCurry to comment on what his thoughts are in the reconstruction in rheumatoid uh, patients such as this, uh, using various different autogenous reconstructions versus alloplastic. Uh, thanks, Gary. Um, yeah, I, I'm sort of uh, against the use of autogenous tissue in these cases. Uh, when I talk to my orthopedic colleagues about uh, uh, the management uh, and reconstruction uh, in uh, knees and hips with uh, uh, rheumatoid disease or uh, high inflammatory arthritic disease. Uh, they laugh when I tell them that anyone would use a, a rib graft or any form of autogenous tissue uh, because they say the, the cells that are causing the damage to the bone from a systemic disease are not going to stop because you do a bone graft. Uh, they're going to be really happy to see more bone in that position. Um, so, you know, alloplastic replacement is, is something that is absolutely necessary for these types of patients in light of the disease process. I'd like to also comment on the uh, options for uh, uh, condylar resorption patients. Uh, the idea of using a sagittal split or any form of osteotomy or distraction in these patients um, doesn't really make a whole lot of sense to me because you're taking a condyle that has um, been compromised by disease and you're gonna build your orthognathic surgery on that condyle. Um, you know, I, I've hit, my experience has been that uh, when patients opt for orthognathic surgery with idiopathic condylar resorption to manage their, their dental facial deformity, uh, that lasts for about two or three years. And then all of a sudden they come back and now they're, they're articulating on the sigmoid notch because that, that uh, compromised bone has melted away. And the same thing happens with the rib graft. Um, the ribs seem to just melt away. Um, you know, rib grafts fail in about 58% of cases. Uh, and I know I'll get some feedback uh, on that, but studies have shown uh, over and over that they either ankylose or they, um, develop, uh, overdevelop, uh, and, and, uh, or fail completely. So uh, those are my thoughts on, on, on that particular issue. Yeah, Lou, there's been several studies on use of costochondral grafts. Um, Wilford looked at the uh, use and study push mirror in rheumatoid or inflammatory autoimmune diseases and alloplastic devices were clearly better suited to managing those cases. Um, Great Ormond Street uh, Hospital sir, re reviewed their 10-year outcomes, and if I recall, it was 2019, 50 cases, and they almost had a 60% complication rate, either overgrowth, undergrowth, resorption, or ankylosis. And they, they concluded that costochondral grafts nowadays are a suboptimal, that was the words that they used, the suboptimal reconstruction for the temporomandibular joint, and that was in children. Um, Andrew, Lou, Abe, any other comments on this before we continue with this case? I think the, the issue Lou raised, which is the case, is if you put new bone into a damaged area with bone resorbing cells, it's going to resorb the bone. So it is totally illogical to put new bone in there. Um, and the alternative of 
vertical sliding uh, split or osteotomies, again, as Lou says, the, the bone is already being damaged. You're not removing the synovial tissue that's causing that damage. And we know from orthopedics that if you do a total knee replacement in a patient with rheumatoid disease, they still get synovitis because the synovium grows back. So we, we see that in the TMJ as well. So why would you put anything other than metal and plastic in there? I don't know. One more, one more comment on the, uh, on the rib graft. Um, there's a study uh, that I was made aware of um, that was done uh, in, uh, I believe, China, but has, has been reproduced in Poland uh, that showed that uh, taking a rib from a child below the age of six creates a permanent uh, uh, chest uh, deformity uh, in 60% of the patients. Uh, over the age of 10, it's about a 30% uh, deformity in the in the uh, in the chest, and this also uh, demonstrates itself as a scoliosis, uh, either a minor or or major scoliosis later in life for these kids. Uh, we are are trying to uh, follow up on on this study uh, at, with our craniofacial unit at Rush, and hopefully have some uh, some new data. On this particular thing, but this is a this is of concern when you're dealing with uh, taking ribs from uh, young children. Yeah, there's also some concern in some camps of using our plastic devices in children, but we'll get to that in the later case where we talk about a pediatric case. Um, Luke or Abe, yeah. any comment? Yeah, Gary, I would just like to make a small comment. Possibly, I would agree with what Luke said and Andrew said. Say just to continue the same thoughts. Alloplastic TMJ reconstruction is possibly more biomechanical ra rather than biological solution to manage these kind of distorted, dysfunctional joints. And this has been very well shown in Lou's paper on rationale of alloplastic reconstruction for patients with ICR or progressive condylar resorption. Just a, just a comment, that's it. Anything to add, Luke? No, I mean, I would agree agree really and I think certainly in the UK a case like that that you didn't offer alloplastic reconstruction I think you would be criticized um, uh, for offering substandard care really nowadays. Okay Andrew would you mind carrying on with this case? Sure um, so this chap we not surprisingly decided to go ahead with bilateral uh, custom-made joint replacements because of the anatomical variations uh, in the on the CT scan. He needed some preoperative orth orthodontic alignment, which was carried out in conjunction with the hospital I was working with, which was in Norwich, which is probably about three hours drive from Nottingham on a good day. Um, currently, it takes about three hours to just get over the bridge in Nottingham because it's partly closed for reconstruction. Um, so bilateral alloplastic custom joints, lengthen the ramus, advance the chin point, close the anterior open bite. And as the occlusal plane was okay and the uh, incisal, upper incisal position was adequate, I didn't feel that the 4-1 was necessary in this case. Although when you see the final result, you may feel that it would have given us a little bit more counterclockwise rotation to impact and advance the anterior maxilla. Um, so the movements can either be planned on the TMJ concepts model, which they send out to you, and was always the way I did it until probably about seven, eight years ago. The alternate is an online planning uh, using the Biomet or TMJ concept system. I'm, I'm a bit old fashioned when it comes to that. I like to be able to feel the models in my hand and feel the teeth fitting together. So I, I tend to pre prefer um, what we can currently do in our lab, which is they scan the models in the position that I've set them up. We then send the scan of the models over to Concepts. They incorporate it into the 3D plan. And then you've got the best of both worlds and you're not shipping plastic models to and fro across the Atlantic. On the uh, models, you then reset the condyle, you set the occlusion and consider extending the prosthesis around the lower border to get rid of that antigonial notching. And I'll illustrate that with in a couple of slides time. So next slide, please. 
So this is the 3D plan and you can see the um, cast up, uh, wax, wax cast up that they made of this and take us all back to our days of making dentures, but gladly the guys in TNJ Concepts do all this for us. And you can see that we've got considerable advancement of the mandible with a step in the prosthesis. And you can see again, the amount of flare and curvature in the prostheses as they sit against the ramus. So this isn't really one that we could do as a uh, stock prosthesis. Um, similarly, advancement is difficult with stock prosthesis, but as we discussed earlier, you can see on this model that the coronoids aren't impinging onto the back end of the maxilla or the back of the uh, zygoma as it goes into the maxilla. And also, he had good mouth opening pre-op. We haven't lengthened the ramus that much, so I didn't need to do coronoidectomies in this one. Next slide. Andy, may I just chime in on this slide and just highlight a few points? So this was one of the indications, remember, for a coronoidectomy. As Andrew has pointed out, in this case, there was no impingement, but this could well be with an advancement. And you see the dog leg design in this prosthesis. That's the advancement. And it can be significant, resulting in some impingement here. Andrew also mentioned that the stock joints are really not suitable for a significant advancement because they lack this posterior lip on the fossa. And that's a key portion when designing uh, a fossa component with a mandibular advancement. They have to have that lip in order to prevent the condylar head displacing and dislocating posteriorly. Sorry, Andrew, I'll pass on to you now. That's fine, next one. So this is what I mean by a wraparound. So you'll see with the previous one, there was still that notch in the antigonial area. And actually it doesn't give a huge cosmetic deficit. This is a female patient, which I'm in the process of doing at the moment. And you can see with the um, wax modeling there that there is a significant wraparound of round about four or five millimeters. And similarly, I've lengthened her ramus by about eight millimeters to fit that. The other issue you can see on this is the amount of yaw on the, on the mandible as it stems in. And that clearly would not accommodate a stock prosthesis. It bends in too far. So we have to bear these things in mind when we're thinking about stock prostheses. Next slide. So I won't go through the surgical approach particularly, but it's a standard preauricular approach, resect the condyle. I do a two-stage resection. I do my second stage from below because I can then see it by direct vision and I'm not putting too much traction on the um, facial nerve as it goes in the bottom end of my wound at the top. Retromandibular approach, irrigate everything with gentamicin solution to reduce the risk of infection, then fit the fossa. We'll then place the separate, fit the IMF, go back, separate gown and gloves, come back to the um, mandibular portion because we don't want to cause cross infection. Uh, then fit the ramus, as Abe said, three screws to fit it, check the occlusion, release the IMF, it still fits okay, then place the rest of the screws. The reason for doing that is then you don't have a multiply perforated ramus if it doesn't quite fit in the way that you want it. Whenever you go into the mouth and come back to the uh, mandible, then you should change your gowns and gloves. And these areas are well isolated during the procedure. Next slide. So post-op, the patients get a hylotherm cooling face mask. If you haven't come across that, it's amazing. The patients find they have significantly less pain afterwards with that, and they seem to get less swelling, although the evidence that's there is not conclusive of that. I give them one pre-op on induction, and two post-op doses of IV uh, comoxiclav. And similarly, I give three milligrams per kilogram of gentamicin on induction of anesthesia. They then get five days of oral antibiotics. I start them mobilizing with the Therabyte device from day one, and they will continue that for one year using the seven seconds, seven repeats, seven times a day um, regime. It, I always try to dislocate the joint on the table and cases particularly where you've done a coronoidectomy, they have some vertical instability and they will often dislocate on the table. About 38% we found in our study 
that uh, Al Mustafa presented. Um, so if they do on the table, I will put them in light elastics for a week with four IMF screws or via the um, arch bars if you put them on. These can be removed at one week. I have not had a post-operative dislocation using that regime and approximately 10% of my patients will dislocate on the table. Next slide. So this is the post-op result and you can see on the calf tracing that there's been significant advancement of the mandible and the maxilla has stayed pretty much in the same position. There's also been vertical lengthening of the ramus and auto rotation in a counterclockwise direction of the mandible to close the anterior open bite um, with significant advancement of the B point. Next slide. And this is the post-op result. And it's a good occlusal result. He is very pleased with the aesthetics. We, have, we did offer him a second stage genioplasty. I don't like doing genioplasty at the same time for a number of reasons. Firstly, you're going into the mouth and doing another procedure. Secondly, you're stretching already stretched tissues and allowing things to settle down over the course of one year will allow you to stretch the tissues a little bit better. And it will also give you a better idea of how much advancement you need. Thirdly, you've already done a four hour operation. So why add another 30 or 40 minutes to that and the significant morbidity that the patient may suffer with stretching of the ID canal yet again. So I tend to do my genioplasty as a second stage. This young man didn't want anything further done. Next slide. <clears throat> so Andrew, I think you've made a, a few very critical points there that are essential. Uh, one is you mentioned cross-contamination, as did Abay, and the how important it is to avoid contamination of the sterile surgical site from going in the mouth. And this back and forth transition has to be handled very carefully with certain draping protocols and changing gowns and gloves. That will minimize the risk of infections around these prosthetic devices, which is the number one complication. The other thing you mentioned that I wanted to touch on and emphasize is with the stop devices, it's absolutely a good idea to provisionally fixate with only two or three screws. The reason being you may need to go back and alter the position of that component or both components. And then you've, you've maybe perforated, uh, if you put all screws in, you've perforated more sites and then you can compromise fixation. With the custom devices, you tend to know in most cases when they're in the planned position because they sort of nestle in and seat. So I have much more confidence with the fossa in, in a custom device completing all the fixation screws, provided I'm happy that it's keyed into its position. So Andrew, this was done as a, a single stage surgery. Um, when would you consider a two stage surgery when using a custom device? So I, I would tend to do two stage when A, there's been a previous infection B, I've had to remove a prosthesis or wear or other reasons because it's not possible to get a good um, CT scan and match for what's going on. And uh, thirdly, in cases of significant ankylosis, I have done ankylosis cases using the um, template resections. I find it easier actually to do the ankylosis cases with a stock prosthesis than using a custom because the whole idea of using a custom prosthesis is that you fit the prosthesis to the patient, not fit the patient to the prosthesis. So for ankylosis cases, I always had a tendency to do um, two stage, resect the ankylosis, put in a spacer, and then three months later, go back in and put in a custom prosthesis. Those would really be the three that I can think of offhand. Yeah, I, I agree. And if, um, if you think about the custom process, custom design and fabrication, whatever surgery you do on the model or virtually has to be exactly duplicated several weeks later at the time of surgery. And if there's a discrepancy, that device won't fit. So that was the original indication for doing a two-stage surgery. In the ankylosis cases where you needed to do a lot of model surgery, then you would stage it and scan the patient again and have the device fabricated. Nowadays, we've got the advantage of VSP, and planning and they can fabricate pretty accurate cutting guides that as Andrew pointed out can help guide the resection and, and guide the, the bony recontouring. Um, any other comments from Luke, uh, Lou or Abay? Uh, if 
So, uh, are you going to summarize the indications for patient specific Gary? Just for the young ones to know. Yeah, we can do that. Yeah, because we have done a case scenario of stock. We have done a case scenario for custom now. Mm -hmm. So, if you can just summarize for the young ones, what would be an ideal indication for a patient specific TM TMJ TJR? So, the, the stock, let's just recap on the stock first of all. Remember, it's the size of the defect, number one. Is the, is the stock device big enough to actually reconstruct the size of the, of the defect and the missing tissue? Number two, the geometry of the ramus, the geometry of the fossa, can you get that device to fit? You mentioned flaring of the ramus, flaring of the gonial notch, the canting and yaw of the fossa, as uh, Dave Sutker has pointed out in, in his work. If those situations and the planets are all aligned, then an alloplastic device, stock device, is probably okay. Right, right. If the challenging anatomical structures, large defects, then the custom device is the safe way to go. In a nutshell. Right. Do any any additional po uh, points there? Uh, yeah, um, uh, th I think those are good uh, good indications. Uh, the other one is. Um, if you're going to do a combined temporomandibular joint replacement and orthognathic surgery, um, the stock prosthesis uh, that's available does not have a posterior lip. And therefore, what we've seen in cases where a stock prosthesis was used for um, uh, the combined TMJ and orthognathic surgery, uh, as you posteriorize the mandible, uh, for your orthognathic surgery, it slips behind the fossa component and um, uh, gets into the auditory canal. And we've seen a number of cases where that's occurred. So that would be a, co a combined TMJ with orthognathic surgery is uh, uh, not an indication for the use of a stock prosthesis. The second would be uh, for uh, uh, craniofacial cases. Uh, there's really no way you can, can reconstruct a craniofacial case with uh, a stock prosthesis. It has to be a, a custom prosthesis. And I, I think we'll get into that uh, you know, when Luke presents his case uh, later on. Um, there was another point I, f I forgot. It'll, it'll, it'll come up. Oh, yeah, it's about uh, infection. But we'll talk about that when Gary uh, talks about his case. Any comments? Uh, the um, the notching on the lower border does that change postoperatively when you sort of uh, correct the, the jaw alignment? Is there any sort of functional matrix changes in that over time? I haven't seen any, Luke. Um, it, but then most of my patients I X-ray very infrequently postop until unless they've got complications. The only reason really I've got post-op x-rays on this young man is because it was an orthodontic case and they were obsessive about it and wanted to present it as a, a case report to one of the orth orthodontic journals. Um, but you would imagine that there would be a degree of loss of that because it, it, it's meant to be the functional matrix that's causing that um, mm. and then the, therefore the overreaction of that. But I haven't seen any obvious remodeling of the bone personally. Thanks. Okay, great. Well, let's uh, take any questions from the audience before we, we move on. Co-hosts, are there any questions that you'd like to put forward? No questions? Gary, I, I'll, I'll post a few questions if, if we okay. can take them. Yeah. And the co-hosts. Uh, there's one question coming in. Uh, if the patient, uh, I think, does arthritic changes of TMJ occur alone or can be accompanied with other joints in the body? So um, what I've seen is probably three patients in my last 10 years of practice in the teenage years who presented with TMJ problems and classic, you know, teenagers, TMJ type problems. 
arthrocentesis not worked, arthroscopy, I found a markedly degenerate disc with the perforation and marked uh, inflammatory changes, subsequently gone into the joint, done a discectomy, cleaned the joint out and synovial biopsy, which has been suggestive of inflammatory arthritis, but no other joints involved. Um, and they've been managed with uh, methotrexate, which has adequately kept them away from having to have an alloplastic replacement. And these patients are now between three and seven years down the line. So yes, we do see patients that get isolated TMJ problems, which is suggestive of inflammatory arthritis problems. Um, similarly, you get a number of patients with inflammatory arthritis conditions that then get TMJ problems. And one of the things that we're debating, and I, I think it, it's taking it too far at the moment, is should we ask our rheumatological colleagues or basically tell our rheumatological colleagues not to inject steroid into the TMJ in a growing patient because it destroys the joint? That's a debate for another day, I think. Yeah, okay. Um, okay. I can have my comments on, on that question is, is it just one joint or can multiple joints be multiple involved? Joints. Yeah. If you're talking about a primary arthritis like rheumatoid, many times the TM joint is the first joint to, to, to develop symptoms and present. So it's often the case that we'll see these patients first and be responsible for diagnosing it. That's the first point. So yes, it can in rheumatoid. Secondary arthritis, like osteoarthritis, of course, that can just be a single joint. Of course, it's wear and tear. Um, so hopefully that answers that question. Any other questions from the viewers before we move on to case three? Uh, there is a particular question. Can I? Uh, yes, Sanjay, please, please come in. Yes, promote. Uh, the question which has been sent is, what is the bite force we get after unilateral or bilateral TJR and its comparison with normal bite force? What the, what the yeah. viewer means is that have we measured it ever? Yes. Let me uh, see if Lou wants to take that question. Yeah. Um, there, there have been some studies uh, done uh, in Germany uh, by Linsen. Uh, I don't have the exact reference, but if you look it up, uh, it's under L-I-S-S-E-N. She has looked into that. Um, interesting thing about bite force is that... Uh, uh, we don't really understand or know the forces in the temporomandibular joint at this time. Uh, my orthopedic colleagues have been able to figure out uh, the loads on the, uh, on the knee and the hip uh, very easily, uh, but we haven't been able to do that. There are a number of reasons for that. Um, there, there are you know, different uh, facial uh, forms, the different classes of occlusion, the fact that uh, Everybody doesn't have 28 teeth. Um, so there are a whole bunch of reasons for it. Um, so what everybody has used uh, is uh, about 120 Newtons for uh, normal bite force, uh, up to about 300 Newtons of bite force. But no one, no one knows for sure what that is. Uh, but if you're interested in uh, the TMJ uh, replacement bite force, uh, the issue there is the fact that we've, uh, we, we've removed the lateral pterygoid muscle, so we've lost all lateral movement. We've lost protrusive movement, so you have a pure rotational movement. Uh, so what we need to do is, is uh, determine uh, what those forces are. Now, what's been done in orthopedics is they've put uh, little transducers in a knee prosthesis, and this has been done in Germany, uh, and they're actually measuring those forces uh, to try to get that through an IRB in the United States or maybe somewhere else in the world would probably be very difficult. Um, so the, the forces are lower uh, than normal bite forces just because of the uh, what's done at surgery, uh, and particularly when you do a coronoidectomy because you've lost all the vertical forces that, uh, uh, that the temporalis puts on the, on the mandible. So the bottom line is uh, we really don't know. We, all we know is that it's less, but I can't put a number on it. So I can add my two cents on that. There, there are finite element studies that have looked at the forces exerted on the contralateral in a unilateral joint replacement case 
the forces that are exerted on the contralateral natural joint. And it is different. The stresses and strains and the load is greater on the natural side. Wolford actually looked, we'll take this a step further. Wolford actually looked at unilateral cases where the opposite side had had a surgery and he discovered that about 30% thereabouts will require joint replacement on the contralateral side. So that is another sort of manifestation of the increased load when you place a unilateral prosthesis due to the exertion of forces on the natural joint. Um, so before we move on to case three, I just want to welcome uh, Joe hey. McCain, who just popped online and he's the president of the American Association of TMJ Surgeons. So welcome Joe and thanks for joining us. In the interest of time, uh, Bishal, we've got to move on, unfortunately. So yeah. we move to case three, um, which is actually my case. And uh, this is a 59-year-old female who was referred in from an outside surgeon because she, she developed this shift in her bite. And she had limited mouth opening for many, many years. It was limited to about 15 millimeters. The outside surgeon had diagnosed this as an osteochondroma. And her complaints were that she'd had limited mouth opening for many years, at least five years with minimal pain. She had no trauma history at all, uh, and none of the other joints were problematic. She had this progressive shift in her bite that she'd noticed, and she had a skin sensitivity to jewelry, whereby she developed a local red rash. And this is an extremely important question that you have to ask every single patient that you're placing a joint prosthesis in. Ask them about metal sensitivities. How do you react to earrings? How do you react to watches? Because if that's positive, as we'll talk about, we may need to do additional steps in the workup. So here's her exam. Um, she didn't have any muscle tenderness on examination. There was some mild tenderness over the left temporomandibular joint. She got this left and right sided open bite, a right sided cross bite, edge to edge incisal relationship. Her incisal opening was 10 millimeters maximal with assistance on examination. And she had some minimal crepitations that were hard to ascultate because of her limited range of motion. This is her CT scan. So you can see on the left uh, that she's got this sclerotic and hyperplastic bone in the glenoid fossa and temporal bone, as well as changes in the condylar head. And on the right side, she also has degenerative changes on the right joint. Here's her 3Ds, and you can see if we zoom in over on the left 3D reconstruction, uh, the, there's this lipping around the condylar, condylar head that's encasing this condyle. So let's open this up for a little bit of discussion. Do we think that the original diagnosis of an osteochondroma was actually correct? And I don't think it was because the appearance of the, um, the CT scan isn't consistent with the typical appearance of an osteochondroma. Remember osteochondromas, defined by the World Health Organization is a cartilage capped bony tumor. It's actually the most common benign bony tumor in long bones. It's 30 to 50% of the benign tumors in long bones, but it's rare in the craniofacial skeleton. It can occur in the condyle, it can occur in the coronoid, and rarely in the symphysis of the, of the mandible. But this process on the CT scan involved changes in condyle and glenoid fossa. So I don't believe that the correct diagnosis was made originally. Um, so what about assessing if you have a case where there's been a slow and gradual progression and the bite has tried to compensate, the occlusion has tried to compensate over time to try and correct the situation, how can you actually identify that? Uh, the way that I do that and recognize it in practice is to simply take study models, hand articulate them, and if you can establish a good occlusion, then there's been very limited um, dental compensations. Uh, if there are obvious changes and significant changes, then you have to make the decision, well, do you do pre-surgical orthodontics and delay surgery until that decompensation has been done? Uh, or do you do uh, the surgery first approach and then do the orthodontics uh, later? Um, any comments from the panelists on, on those thoughts? Okay, then we'll move on. So in this particular case, we did the study models and they did reveal dental compensations. And therefore I referred her for an orthodontic consultation. They decided to do the orthodontics pre-surgically. So the decompensations were done pre-surgically and then we took her to uh, surgery. So the assessment in this case was she had a compensated occlusion. 
she had osteoarthritis with reactive hyperplastic bony changes, the condyle and the fossa, and she had a possible metal sensitivity. So the plan for her is pre-surgical orthodontics to decompensate and provide a bilateral alloplastic uh, joint replacement. So, first of all, would, would each panelist like to comment on which, whether it would be a stock or a custom joint that, that would be their preference in this case? We'll go along the panel. Let's start with Lou. Are you there, Lou? Yeah, yeah. Um, I, th there's no question I would, would use a, a custom device. Uh, I, this is not a case uh, where you, you could adequately fit a, uh, uh, a stock device. Um, so there's no question in my mind. Yeah, Andrew? All right, we'll move on to Luke. Uh, sorry, I, I was muted. Oh, okay. Um, I agree. I think the anatomy of this dictates that we use a custom device. And um, again, the, the functional limitations of a stock prosthesis would negate its use in my view. And Luke? Yeah, I agree completely. Okay, Abe? I would agree with the, the use of custom-made uh, joints, uh, Gary. And there is another point what you have made saying possible metal sensitivity. So right. could you enumerate on that, Gary? Absolutely. So I think, first of all, before we jump onto that, there's been unanimous agreement across the panelists, including me, that this is an ideal case for a custom joint. Lou, would you like to comment on what other tests you may feel are appropriate for this patient, given the history of metal sensitivities? Right. Um, you're opening up a, a big uh, can of worms here. <laughs> I know. That's good. <laughs> Let me start out by saying that um, I, I work with probably one of the world's experts in uh, orthopedic uh, uh, material hypersensitivity, uh, Nadim Halab. And um, we have this discussion over and over. Uh, and I will start out by saying <laughs> that there is no consensus on, on this. Uh, we, we really don't understand completely metal hypersensitivity, but uh, I will give you uh, my thoughts on it. First of all, uh, there are three tests that have been used uh, around the world. The skin patch testing, which is the oldest. Uh, the Melissa. Uh, Melissa is uh, the, uh, <clears throat> I have to look, look at this, the memory lymphocyte immunostimulation assay. Uh, the problem with that test is that there are many, many false positives with it. And then finally, there's the lymphocyte um, uh, test, the LLT. Um, Transformation. Pardon? LTT. LTT. Yeah, right. LTT. Uh, lymphocyte transformation test, uh, where blood is taken from the patient uh, and radioactively um, the cells, the lymphocytes are reactive to the materials. Uh, now, th there are a number of false positives with, with that as well, but not as many as with the Melissa. Unfortunately, uh, that test is not available around the world. So none of those tests are, are very good. The one test that I would not advise anyone to do is the uh, coup coupon testing, where you actually take a piece of the material and put it under the patient's skin, uh, on their arm or their back or someplace. Uh, this test has been shown to be absolutely um, impossible to get any good results from. In fact, the um, a group in Germany who represents the Dermatology uh, Society has recommended that, that test not be done. There are a couple of reasons that, that the skin testing and coupon testing uh, on the skin don't work um, is that you're testing for the wrong cells. Um, the Langerhans cells that react to a substance on the skin are different than the T cells that react to metals that are implanted deeply. So you get uh, many false positives with skin tests, number one. Number two, you can actually sensitize the patient to the metal 
that you're testing for. And um, there are no um, uh, real uh, confirm confirmations that, you know, you can say that if a patient has a reaction that is this red, that it's, you know, a, a positive reaction as opposed to someone that's a little bit red. Uh, but the main reason is that, that you're testing for the wrong cells. So those are the tests that are available. Now, in a patient that gives you the uh, history of being sensitive to uh, jewelry uh, or has tested positive in some way for uh, a material, um, you must proceed with some form of testing. And the, the, the one that has the least um, false positive is the LTT. So. Yeah, thank you. We'll, we'll discuss it with the rest of the panelists at the end. But what I wanted to share with you is this is this patient's LTT test result. So if you look, there's a whole panel of different materials, aluminum, cobalt, chromium. Women have a much higher likelihood of being uh, sensitive to nickel for some reason, men for cobalt and chromium. Um, but look at her reactivity level to nickel here. The T cells really disliked the nickel and she was considered highly reactive. So this is a concern if we're gonna put a nickel containing device in the patient. We have a concern there and we should probably think about an alternative material rather than implanting something that we know is potentially going to be a problem. So metal allergies, let me just spend a few minutes going through some of the things that Lou mentioned here. This is a study from her lab uh, in Lou's lab um, looking at the prevalence of metal sensitivities in different groups of patients. Normal, right here, normal populations is about 10% uh, of the population had some metal sensitivity. The red group here, this cluster, represents those that had well-functioning joint replacements. And the reason we have an increased uh, metal sensitivity rate is with any metal component that is articulating. There's a process called tribocorrosion, which is a combination of wear, mechanical wear, and chemical corrosion. The net result of tribocorrosion is it releases metal particles, and it's called metalosis. That then results in localized tissue reactions and also can result in systemic tissue reactions. Lou quite correctly pointed out that the cells, the antigen presenting cells in the skin, the Langerhan cells, which are a derivative of a dendritic cell, is a different antigen presenting cell than is present in deep tissues around the joint prosthesis. The anti antigen presenting cells around the joint prosthesis are actually monocytes that then activate the T cells. So this LTT test looks at activated T cells. So we're assessing what we think currently to be the correct cell. Now look at the blue group here. <clears throat> this is a metal on metal prosthesis, much higher release of metalosis. And so therefore the population that have metal on metal have a higher rate of metal sensitivities. And a poorly functioning or failing prosthesis had the highest rate of metal sensitivities. <clears throat> so going back to the skin patch test, which for years was actually the one that most people used. And now we recognize that because it's testing the wrong cell, it's actually not that reliable. And the orthopedic surgeons have looked at this, and this paper showed no increase in the risk of knee arthroplasty failure in patients who were skin patch positive. So they, they looked at 127 patients, 161 knee arthroplasties. After skin patch testing, 56 patients were positive. They followed them for five years and they concluded that the positive skin patch test for, for metals was of lit, little practical value in predicting the midterm outcome after total knee arthroplasty. And therefore, skin patch testing cannot be strongly recommended as a method to guide the selection of implant type. There are multiple other studies that show really no correlation between positive skin patch testing and TJR outcomes. And here's a list of other studies. So the skin patch test isn't really the best option. So that leaves us with a clinical dilemma. Okay, how should we approach this patient that reports preoperatively that they have a potential hypersensitivity? In the US, what I think most people are doing is 
the LTT test if they report a hypersensitivity reaction. And then if it's positive, they proceed with fabrication of an implant that does not contain the allergen. So for example, the uh, Biomet stock is cobalt chromium, does contain nickel, and the condylar head of the TMBA concept device also contains nickel. So in these cases, we would fabricate an all titanium device. And I know Luke is uh, pretty much exclusively using all titanium devices to avoid this problem. It becomes potentially more problematic if you discover after the patient has had the joint replacement in and been functioning for quite some time and they develop hypersensitivity symptoms. How do you handle that? Well, this is from Lou Mercury's um, paper here that was published in 2019. You have to rule out all the other possibilities, intrinsic and extrinsic, and manage those if they're present. Then, if the symptoms are still ongoing, then we have to do an LTT test, which stratifies them into positive or negative. If it's positive, then we really got to give some serious consideration to explantation of that device and converting it to an allergen-free device. If that test is negative, then we can maintain and monitor with some conservative treatments. So this is her uh, final result, initial on the top and final result after pre-surgical orthodontics, bilateral joint replacements with all titanium devices and um, finishing orthodontics post-operatively. So let's uh, open this up to some panel discussion. Um, any comments from either Luke, uh, Andrew, or Abe, or Lou? Well, the I mean, pure titanium is, is, is a little bit of a misnomer, I think, isn't it? Um, anyway, they're, they're the purest you can get. I mean, I only use the uh, concepts sort of pure titanium, but it still does have traces of other metals in and it, um, it, it is a difficult decision because um, patient could be positive in a test, but you still don't really know whether they're going to react to the traces uh, in the condyle of the implant. If you do use, you know, a so-called pure titanium implant, there's still an uncertainty in it. If you're in a situation where, for example, in, with your patient, you could act, you could justify saying, well, you're probably allergic to everything, so I'll give you the purest I can, and the tests actually won't add anything. Because even if the tests come up positive, you're still going to use that implant. So you could have sort of cut out all of those tests and gone straight to the pure titanium implant. It's a bit controversial. It could have been an option. Well, I'd like to make a comment um, on that. Um, Yes, there are other metals uh, in uh, what you call pure titanium. Um, it contains uh, uh, some iron. Uh, and the other issue with uh, the pure titanium uh, is that it's still an alloy and it contains uh, vanadium as well as aluminum. And there are some reports now of uh, sensitivity to vanadium uh, as well as uh, aluminum. So what's happening now in orthopedics is the, they're looking at other combinations uh, of alloy for titanium using things like niobium, uh, but those are still uh, uh, under question. I, I'd also like to make a couple comments on the, um, the uh, post-implant hypersensitivity patient. Um, in all the years that I was doing joint replacements, I saw very, very few these post-implant hypersensitivity issues. But what I did see in patients um, was patients who came back with intermittent swelling. And um, what people are calling now hypersensitivity. And they're getting LTT tests and they're getting reports back that show that the patient has some sensitivity to one of the metals that, that Gary showed on that list. The problem is, if you, if you look at that chart that Gary put up there, if you have an implant in place that contains a metal, you're going to get a positive test because of the tribal corrosion issue, the, the shedding of ions as you use that device. So what we started to look at now 
or other things that may be going on inside this joint that may be giving us this intermittent swelling. And one of the things that uh, Joe McCain has actually looked at very nicely and has a paper that will be soon uh, in, the, uh, in the literature is uh, building on what uh, Ken Murakami talked about was uh, synovial plica of what's called the synovial, uh, uh, <coughs> excuse me, synovial entrapment syndrome. Um, this is known in the knee. Patients will come back after having knee replacements, complaining of pain and swelling, either on the lateral or medial aspect of their knee. And what the orthopedic surgeons do is they realize that these patients have synovial entrapment. As Andrew said earlier, when you put a device in a patient, you get a neosynovium that develops. That neosynovium has folds in it. Those folds can get entrapped between the bearing surfaces of the device and cause an inflammation. That inflammation then will cause pain and swelling. And so if it happens in the knee, why can't it happen in the temporal mandibular joint? And so working with Ken's theory and Joe and his group's uh, arthroscopy experience, he has arthroscoped, he and Howard Israel have arthroscoped joints and shown that there is uh, a development of this uh, synovial entrapment. And by removing that tissue arthroscopically, he's been able to solve these patients' problems. So many of these patients that we think, or some people think are hypersensitivity patients are really synovial entrapment patients. Now, I would not recommend anyone doing arthroscopy on a joint replacement because you're going to, you're going to uh, disturb the uh, polyethylene or the metal condyle. And once you do that, you end up shedding even more material, which creates a foreign body reaction, which will add to the insult. So what, if you think this patient um, has one of these synovial entrapments, the simple thing is a simple incision, preauricular incision, clean out the joint, and you will resolve this issue for the patient. Um, so I, I think these are issues that, that uh, need to be looked at closer. As, as I said, Joe's paper is coming out in the journal soon, and hopefully uh, we'll be able to study this more. Andrew, Andrew anything to add? Sorry, can I, can I just say, um, Lou, um, Ken is online. So Ken Murakami, welcome to the Japanese uh, Society of TMJ Surgery who are present. Uh, Ken's uh, lights lit up when you mentioned synovial plica. So uh, thanks for that, Lou. Um, my, my experience, obviously, um, Bernie Specula and myself, Rob Hencher, reported issues with uh, <clears throat> patients with metal sensitivity, which were related to the Christensen prosthesis. I haven't seen a case where I could conclusively say there has been um, metal sensitivity but I've always patch tested patients. And sadly, there isn't the free availability to LTT in the UK or probably across the world. There are only probably two or three centers where LTT is regularly carried out. Um, so I agree with Lou's comments. It possibly isn't an issue with metal on plastic, but it may well have been a big issue with the metal on metal prosthesis that uh, Christensen had and the proposed metal on metal prostheses that are being used around the world. And, and I know there's one in India that's stainless steel on stainless steel. And I think we've got to be very careful with new prostheses that we don't reinvent a wheel that was broken a long time ago and proved to be broken by orthopedic experience. Right, thanks Andrew. That sort of touches on the other devices that are available by manufacturers around the world and um, some are metal on metal. We've got to look at the history in, in orthopedics and they no longer use the metal on metal devices. And we have to learn from that. I think the metal on plastic, you're right, it's probably much lower uh, results, uh, much lower levels of metal particles and metallosis, but um, uh, we don't have the correct answers right now. Any final comments, Lou? Uh, there was a 
there was a question that I saw on here um, about uh, well, Merritt's de new device that he's developed where he's trying to attach the lateral pterygoid muscle to the, to the device that he's developed um, to return the patient to uh, uh, lateral excursions and, and protrusive movements. Um, that's been tried by a number of people and I've attended Maurice's lectures on this. He shows it in, in goats, um, but you know, goats don't have TMJ problems. Um, so uh, I don't know that that's a, a direct uh, correlation. Uh, we'll have to see how those goes, how those things go. Um, I'm not so sure that, uh, that adding uh, lateral movements and protrusive movements is going to increase the quality of life for these patients. In all the joints I, I did in my career, I never had one patient complain about the fact that they couldn't move their jaw left and right or that they couldn't move their jaw forward. Um, patients don't understand that movement. They're just happy to be able to open and close their mouth and look better. Uh, so I'm not so sure that that's a, a, a positive result. Um, we've looked at all this, the devices that are, are being uh, developed around the world in, in the paper that we did with Ross Elledge and Bernie Speculin. Um, there are now, you know, following up on that paper, there are now about 30 devices being made around the world. Um, in, in about 17 countries. Uh, Brazil leads the way with eight. Um, the concern that we have is that these devices are coming on the market um, without being tested very well, uh, without any regulatory uh, con uh, concern by their governments or uh, something like the FDA. Uh, in the United States now, there are only two devices that are available and FDA approved. Um, and unfortunately, these other devices are, 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 are being developed all over the world, some of them with uh, uh, 3D printing. Uh, we have a study going on now on 3D printing. That's not really reached the level uh, that it should be for, for, uh, for orthopedic devices. So I doubt it's at that level for TMJ devices either. Maybe at some point we can discuss some of the problems associated with uh, 3D printing um, because that's become a, a, apparently a very cheap way to make these devices. And unfortunately, you get what you pay for. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. All right. Well, let's take some questions from the viewers before yeah, we move on to the case. Yeah, uh, Just a thought. It might be a hypothetical situation where I'm talking about What's your uh, take or what's the panel's take on uh, role of peak in temporomandibular joint reconstruction, the carbon reinforced peak, polyethoethoketone? Can I, so, can I get into that one? Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah. There's, a, there's one peak device available uh, and it's been made in Brazil. Um, one, of the, uh, one of my colleagues, uh, in fact, he's the head of our, our orthopedic research lab at Rush has written a very nice paper, uh, actually it's a chapter in, a, in an orthopedic textbook on the use of PEAK. Um, the problem with PEAK is that uh, it, it, it is unproven um, in orthopedics for uh, a bearing surface. Now, uh, there's a, a gentleman by the name of Kurtz in the United States who's developed a, a unilateral uh, knee prosthesis that's just undergoing some clinical uh, studies now that uses PEAK. Um, but PEAK is, is uh, not been proven and has been shown in, in a number of orthopedic studies uh, as not a, a, a proper bearing surface for uh, a joint prostheses. Thanks, Lou. Okay. okay. Gary, questions from the, yeah. Andrew. Can I just say I've got to go? I apologize to everyone. I had a prior meeting, so uh, I'm, I'm logging off you. now. But thank you very much, and and good luck to you. Andrew. Enjoy the rest of the seminar. Thank you. Thanks, Andrew. Take care. Thanks, Andrew. Any questions from the viewers in the audience? Yeah, Gary, can I ask a question from the audience? Yes, go ahead, Michelle. From the audience is how you select the. Uh, stroke processes, they are available in the narrow and standard size. 
how you will select the size of the processes what are points we will consider when we are selecting the stock processes Abey, would you like to take that one yeah <laughs> i knew you would <laughs> When we are selecting the processes, add on Gary. If I miss out on something, when we select the standard processes or the standard stock or the stock processes which is available in the inventory, the first thing you need to look at is as a thumb rule. What I was taught by David Sutka when I did my fellowship in Toronto is you select the first up, uh, you select the standard or the mandibular foot plate in such a way that it does not cross the inferior border. and broader the process is the better it is from an indian perspective if i have to say regarding selection of processes a standard processes it's not going to be a one size to fit everybody but what we have seen over a period of time doing joint replacements using standard processes or uh, stock joint processes from an indian scenario a 45 to 50 mm length processes is what is suitable in the indian population so the bigger the process is the better it is possibly keep in mind or bear in mind that the process is not to cross the inferior border the broader it gets more the surface contact better the stability and smaller the fossa eminence process is the better it is number one secondly when you choose from your standard narrow and offset your offset and narrow when you have the narrow processes in the stock the narrow is used when you have patients who have been previously operated upon let's take for example ankylosis and there is very less of host bone which is available so it's at that particular instance the narrow prosthesis comes into play and of course offset when you have the ramus fossa angulation which is where in the medialization of the fossa happens then you need to select on to the offset that's how i have looked into it anything to add on gary no i think that's pretty much it the length is determined because you don't want to have it overhanging the angle um the standard foot plate versus narrow you have to consider the inferior alveolar nerve with a stock prosthesis you really don't know where that is you have to guess your mind's eye and position the screws in areas where you believe that, that it will miss the nerve uh one other comment that I will add is with the stock prosthesis is actually there's actually more surgical skill involved in placing them um nice. lou and i as clinical consultants for concepts we see cases from time to time more often than we should actually where these devices have been terribly mal positioned uh so you've just got to be very careful using these devices they're rotated up they're right next to the teeth the screws are through roots the screws are through nerves all of these things can happen um and custom devices do actually help to minimize those risks any other questions from the audience before we move what is the preference of the preferably locking screws or no locking screws so what is the sequence of screw fixation in ramus component so you're breaking up but i think i heard non locking versus locking screws yes yeah so currently so the devices, the sure currently the devices that we have in the us f the fda approved devices concepts and biomet neither use locking screws Uh, and that is actually why where it becomes really critical when you're inserting a stock device that you have the stability against the bone and also when you're inserting a custom device one of the common mistakes is you don't take it off off the condyle when you're resecting it and then when you insert the custom device it's actually interfering and not sitting over and flush with the ramus because you've got a bony interference what happens at that situation then is you have bone resorption at that contact point and the prosthesis then becomes loose which is a problem um so that's one of the key things surgically and one of the tips that I always emphasize in my lectures is you have to resect adequately at least as much as the planning otherwise you'll have that bony interference so none of the US devices currently use locking screws to answer that question lou any other comments there Uh, uh yeah um i'd like to make two comments uh, about screws uh one um advantage of a custom device over a stock device is that you know the exact length of the screws that you're going to be placing um this is important because you only want bicortical screws 
what we learned very early in this was that if you are told to place, or if, if, the, if the mandible will accommodate a 10 millimeter screw and you use a 14 millimeter screw, you're going to impinge on the medial pterygoid muscle. And when the patient functions afterwards, that screw is going to cause inflammation on that muscle and the patient is going to have pain uh, at the angle of the mandible. The same is true with the fossa screws. If they're supposed to be six millimeters and use an eight millimeter screw, uh, the first thing that can happen is you can get into the middle cranial fossa, but the worst thing, which is bad, but more commonly what happens is you use too long of a screw with a stock device, you get into the temporalis muscle. And as that muscle moves, it gets inflamed and causes pain. So screw length is one thing. The other thing that, that, that is of concern with a stock device is that uh, uh, Nadim Halab, uh, who I mentioned before, works in our lab, um, listed eight reasons why an all, all ultra-high molecular polyethylene fossa component is not favorable in orthopedics, uh, especially when placed against bone. You have increased backside wear due to uh, the component uh, uh, function against bone. Uh, you have poor surface for bone fixation. Uh, you have decreased bone removal, remodeling on the surface of the ultra-high molecular polyethylene. No macro texturing to enhance short-term uh, and long-term bone attachment. To, to, you can lead, it can lead to increased potential for biofilm infection, since the biofilm infections usually occur around the uh, ultra-high molecular component of a device. You have increased chance of cold flow and ultra-high molecular, uh, ultra molecular polyethylene fracture, and you have less control uh, over the um, post-bone side implant orientation due to greater likelihood of osteolysis on the host bone side over time. And there's a poor surface for cement, uh, cementation, at least in orthopedics, which we don't use cement. So there, there are no orthopedic devices on the market presently that are all ultra-high molecular weight polyethylene. They always have a metal component behind it. Uh, so I, I think one of the, the flaws of the present custom devices that do not have uh, a, a metal backing are all the reasons that, uh, that Nadim has talked about. And some of the things that, that we've seen in the failed uh, devices that have had to be replaced. It's very difficult to get uh, a, a totally ultra high molecular weight polyethylene fossa to uh, fit properly. Um, also, the uh, flange that has, where the screws have to go through to attach it to the zygomatic arch uh, has a memory to it. And as you put the screws in, the, the device will have, the, the memory of that material will tend to pull the, the screws. And if that device is not stable because of the cold flow property of the ultra high molecular weight polyethylene, the screws will ultimately loosen and the device will, will fail. So uh, I think these are important considerations when uh, thinking about the use of uh, or the development of, uh, of a stock device. That's great, Lou. Thank you. Excellent Gary? point. Yes. Gary? Yeah, there's one uh, study by the Melbourne group from uh, George Dimitrodis. Are you there, Gary? Yeah. Yeah. There's one study from the Melbourne University by Dr. George Dimitrodis. I just want your take and loose take on this, where they have compared the Melbourne prosthesis with the biomet microfixation. And uh, they've gone on to say that the stability with the Melbourne prosthesis, which has a double arm, but the screw fixation goes on to the distal of the double arm with six screws on that compared to the biomet which houses four screws. So what is your take? Does the number of screws or the length of the screws have a better standing on the foot plate, number one? More number of screws incorporated into the foot plate, does it provide more stability and better adaptability? What's your take and uh, Lou's take on this? So I'll, I'll answer first and I'll hand it over to Lou. Um, first of all, I've never used a Melbourne prosthesis. Uh, okay. It's not an FDA approved device, so I can't speak with first-hand knowledge. Okay. 
to answer your second part of that question with the number of screws, the important factor is how well it's adapted to the underlying bone. If you have really good adaptation, then you can get away with fewer screws and have good stability. If you don't have a good adaptation, you're probably going to need more. That's just my common sense thought process about it. But I, I, as I say, I haven't used the Melbourne prosthesis. Lou, any additional points? Um, no, I, I think that was the point I was going to make. That the adaption of the device to the bone is the most important thing. Um, yep. There was a, a, a study done at the Mayo Clinic with the TMJ Concepts device where they got away with uh, using uh, only four screws. Um, thing that's most important about the screws, uh, this is from work done uh, in uh, China as well as in, uh, in, in uh, Portugal, um, that the top screw is the most important screw. Um, if you think about the rotational movement the moment arm physically is at the top screw. So the, the top screw bears the most functional force. So you've got to put the top screw in. What I've noticed in many of these uh, devices, the, the 30 devices that we've been looking at, is that most people only put the bottom screws in and they never put the top screw in. And the, the top screw, again, is the most important screw from a finite element analysis standpoint. So uh, I think it's important that everybody understands that get the top screw in. Now, uh, why do people not put the top screw in? Because well, it's the hardest one to get. Yeah, it's the hardest one to get, okay? Um, and if you're working through a really tiny incision, yeah, it, <laughs> it is the hardest one to get in. But with a stock device, um, they tell you, you only have to put the bottom three screws in and that's the end of it. Um, and they don't show that it, how important it is to put the rest of the screws in. So anyway, screw, screw position and screw length are re extremely important, but the most important thing is adaption of that foot plate to the lateral ramus of the mandible so that you do not get micro motion. As soon as you start micro motion, the device is going to eventually fail. Right. Well, guys, we yeah, got to move on. Gary, to Gary, design. Gary, Gary, yeah. can I come in with a quick question related to this? Now, how much can you extend the design of the condylar component beyond the confines of the bone? Uh, my question is, can you use the condylar component to augment the ramus, uh, increase the vertical height of the ramus? If so, how much can you do that with the uh, design? So the answer is yes, you can. And we'll probably see some of that in this next case, which is a, um, or certainly the one after that when Luke is talking about extended prosthesis. So if that question doesn't get answered in the subsequent presentations, we'll answer it later. But the answer is one yes, more. and extended. Then Go one ahead. more, mm -hmm. one more. Uh, uh, this was raised earlier by the audience. Uh, uh, when would you uh, consider TGR in uh, a patient with uh, ICR? Uh, when the disease is active, or would you wait for the disease to settle down? So it depends on, and Liz touched on this already, um, it depends on how conservative you are. Uh, if the device, if the process is active, you've resorbed the condyle down to the sigmoid notch. There is no orthognathic surgery that is going to really give correction of the vertical height of the ramus back and have it, long, have it be long-term have long-term stability. There's only one way to do that, which is the alloplastic metal and plastic don't resorb. If we do any form of orthognathic surgery, whether it be inverted L's, interpositional bone grafting or sagittal split osteotomies, then we're still working with stable, if it's asymptomatic, but abnormal foundations. Uh, and it's worse still if you if you have a situation where the ICR isn't stable, because then why would you build a house on unstable foundations? Um, that would be my take in answering that question. Lou, any... So would you do it? Would you do it uh, early? You see signs of ICR, and you know it is ICR, and it's not resolved down to the neck of the condyle. Then, yeah. So my protocol is: I will observe in an active case that hasn't lost down to the condyle, the condylar neck and sigmoid notch already. If it's active and mild, 
I will follow it, put them in a splint to allow you to follow it and monitor for any occlusal changes. Once it's become stable for six to 12 months, then we evaluate the condyle and say, okay, is there enough here and it's stable that we can work with and then proceed with orthognathic surgery. But they always get told that we're working with abnormal foundations and I can't guarantee long-term stability. Yes, it's been stable for six to 12 months, but I can't guarantee that it's gonna remain stable. So we may have to in the future do a joint replacement. Um, if it doesn't stabilize or it resorbs down to the sigmoid notch, then that's an, that's an alloplastic device in my practice. Okay. Gary, can I come in for a second? Yeah, Lou, somehow. Yeah, uh, this is uh, to both you and Lou. We have spoken about uh, idiopathic condylar resorption at, uh, at, at length. Uh, a question which might be hypothetical at the sense, what happens? How do you manage a patient with adolescent ICI? If you catch them young, possibly between 11 to 16 years or 11 to 15 years, Lou has got a paper on this. And what is your take? How do you manage these children? Did you want to comment on your paper? Yeah, for, I mean, for the, for the very reasons that, that Gary uh, mentioned and that I mentioned earlier, um, my experience, and, and again, I, this is something that I think we have to sort of understand that people like myself and Gary and some of the other of us, we're at tertiary centers. Uh, we're not at primary centers. So we see a lot of the failures of things. And so I'm sort of tainted by the fact that patients are coming to me that have had failed orthognathic surgery for idiopathic condyl resorption, have had failed rib grafts. But I've also done it myself. I've done the, the rib graft for idiopathic condyl resorption. I've done the orthognathic surgery and seen my own failures. And so I came to the conclusion that why should I put the patient through an operation, an orthognathic surgery or a rib graft, when I know what's gonna happen? They're gonna be back in two to three years to have another surgery. And if I've done orthognathic surgery, you know, I've taken the maxilla up and I've auto-rotated the mandible and all that kind of stuff. And they now have come back three years later with an open bite because everything has failed. Now I've got a real problem because now I've got to redo the maxilla in most cases and I've got to do a joint replacement. So I've put this patient through a number of operations when, when they first appear with the issue, I can go ahead and do a joint replacement. Now we have a long discussion with the parents about this because it becomes a quality of life issue for the patient. And they understand that, you know, this device in 30 years may have to be replaced or a component of it may have to be replaced. But what is the quality of life of that patient at this point in time and what could it be over the next 30 years? And how many more surgeries is the patient willing to undergo? So that's my thought process. All right, folks, we're going to have to move on because we're getting a little bit behind schedule here. So let's move on to case number four. Um, Abay, do you want to take over here? Yeah, yeah. Uh, the case number four, I'm sure uh, me, Pramod, and Gary were there together here for this particular case. It was operated as a part of our uh, demonstration for uh, custom-made joint at Amrita. This is possibly a year or two years ago. Patient reported to us... Uh, a diagnosed case of Treacher Collins syndrome. And on eliciting history, the patient revealed to us that she had undergone multiple surgeries. And when I say multiple surgeries, there were three sittings of multiple distraction osteogenesis. For the benefit of the young ones who are listening to us all over the world, this is an established case of Treacher Collins syndrome, which has its effect both on the entire maxillofacial complex so you have a predominant mandibular micrognathia as well as hypoplasia of the zygoma. And sometimes these deformities also tend to involve the orbits as well as the cranial base. So this patient came to us with history of multiple surgeries. She underwent distraction at the age of six years, following the distraction at the age of six years where she underwent a sleep study for her obstructive sleep apnea. We had her apnea hypopnea index was severe. 
She was again distracted with a multiplanar distractor at the age of 13 years, and she underwent multiple staging of distraction and post distraction on the second phase, this lady went into full blown ankylosis. And once gone into ankylosis, you, it's very clinically evident on the slide, you have a class two profile, a classical bird face or a fish face appearance where the mandible has rotated clockwise, you see the hypoplasia of the mala regions, shallowing of the orbits, hypoplasia of the orbits, you see the maxillomandibular complex is totally distorted. Clinical pictures would clearly show you an anti-mongoloid slant. And these, paper, these patients come with a whole lot of issues. So she, we thought as a team that we need to give her back at least a facial features. And we thought of a joint replacement. That's the occlusal status of the patient post distraction and presently with ankylosis and hypoplasia of the zygoma as well as the zygomatic arch, which is totally gone, missing there. And you see that the ankylosis is a block bone and you can't have a delineation of what is normal against abnormal. So the challenge was we were treating a patient with known treacher Collins syndrome or mandibulofacial dysostosis. And if you see there, she's got a high mandibular plane angle and the chin is as well hypoplastic. So to summarize, she's got a mandibular micrognathia, a microgenia, shallow orbits, skull of, base of the skull is also altered. So we, next slide, please. So we plan for a joint replacement at this stage. Uh, Gary, could you go back to that slide there on the discussion part, Gary? Yes. Right, Gary. Okay. So you've touched on some of the issues there. This, this patient is a complex case. And as I said, we operated this in 2017. Um, issues of the syndromic issues, but also the sleep apnea issues. Um, this is clearly a case for a custom joint. There is no stock joint that is going to have any role here whatsoever. Um, what we did encounter were some anatomical variations. Uh, the stylomastoid foramen where the facial nerve emerged was very, very um, ectopic. It was actually medial to the glenoid fossa, believe it or not. Uh, so we have to understand that with these complex syndromic cases, there are lots of things that has to go into the planning uh, and consideration when you're preparing for these cases. Um, Abe, would you like to talk about sequencing and the other panelists can talk about sequencing when you're doing a joint replacement, which is sterile with orthognathic, which is a transoral procedure, not right. sterile. Right. Since this patient was planned for a custom-made joint and we were looking at a girl who's already been through a lot of psychological issues, we planned for a custom-made joint and then we went in for alloplastic reconstruction. So when we have a significant amount of uh, mandibular asymmetry, you know, most, most of the times these patients would benefit from a bijaw surgery as well as a joint replacement. So we plan to go ahead and finish off the joint replacement. So what initially we did was you go and uh, to speak in general, we would do the mandible first. That's what you want me to talk, Gary. Start with the sequencing of, uh, or you want me to take the sterile zone and the, how do you want me to take it? Up? What I was referring to is the sterile transition. So in my practice, for example, with, it, with an orthognathic, I do the joint first. Yeah. Um, yeah. And in fact, yeah. in two cases, right, where you've got a very steep occlusal plane, we can have a short ramus, let's take a, an ICR case, or a, even this case, you have, exactly. to lengthen, you have to lengthen that ramus. So you can't right. really do the orthognathic portion first anyway. Right. But my concern and rationale for doing the sterile part first is just that, it's sterile first. Then yeah. you go into the mouth where you have the risk of, of cross-contamination and having completed the sterile part and closed the incisions. Do you agree with that, Abey? I agree with you. I think you laid the foundation for us, possibly during our courses of uh, maintaining the sterile zone from the, separating the oral cavity from the TM joint and having two separate sets of instruments, using the op site as well as the uh, drapes for patients and using different instruments. I think that's the way we, are, we do go about nowadays, at least post uh, Amrita training. Okay, well, let's skip on through the rest of this case. Yeah, so this was the plan which came up from the biomet microfixation. And if you see the first diagram, the 
plans for the counterclockwise rotation of the mandible is already there. You could see that the joint replacement and you have the X. I wouldn't call it. I think Luke is here. If he's there, would he term this as an extended TJR? Uh, if Lou is there and Luke is there, how do you take it up, Gary? Would you term this as an ETJR? Well, it, you want to touch on that? I think, I think you would have to consider that approximately extended. Uh, right, Luke. Yeah, yeah, sure. Fulfills the criteria. It does fulfill your criteria of uh, ETJR, Luke? Yeah, Pro yeah. proximally extended. Okay, okay. So this patient to be thought of a simultaneous orthognathic and the joint replacement. So the first picture onto the left side of your screen, we would clearly see that the alloplastic TJR is in place with the mandible in the desired advanced position. That's in a class three with the intermediate splint there. The second diagram in the center on the top row clearly depicts the removal of the splint with the advanced mandible. And you can see the gap, which is predominantly there. That means the mandible has rotated counterclockwise and come up anteriorly. And the second bottom row, you see the first diagram where a left one osteotomy is done so that there is a posterior increase in the facial height and the maxilla has moved downwards. And finally, the mandible, the maxilla following the mandible and the chin procedure in place for the genioplasty. So as Luke possibly said, uh, we went in back in literature and found, and then I, I thought I should term this as an ETJR. And that's where yesterday when I wanted to understand what the ETJR was all about. Thank you, Luke. Yeah, and this is the clinical picture where we went in. And as Gary spoke about, this patient had a lot of challenges for us because of the distortion of the regular anatomy. There was a very, uh, possibly if you ask me, there, was, there were issues when we were operating the skull base was short medial laterally. Gary, would you come in at this time and tell us the issues, what we faced? Um, yes, sure. Uh, so the, the biggest issue, this, this slide shows nicely the use of the cutting guides, right? So this is a virtual surgical plan used to its maximum capacity where you would really struggle to, to approach this with a single stage surgery without the advantage of cutting guides. So that's number one, the anatomy is so distorted and abnormal. So either you, you do a two stage surgery with a custom device or we do virtual surgical planning and use the surgical cutting guides to predictably make the right osteotomies. Number one, then number two, all of the other anatomical variations, the, the lack of the external auditory canal, where we normally use this as a guide to get down to the joint as we're accessing it surgically, that wasn't there. I already mentioned the stylomastoid foramen was very ectopic. It was actually medial to the glenoid fossa. Um, and we didn't recognize that in the design process. So the, the footprint of the fossa prosthesis here actually encroached on that very, very closely. Uh, so they were, the, they were the surgical challenges that I think we faced when we did this case. And this was a case with Dr. Pramod Subash as, as uh, uh, co-surgeon and, and myself in 2017. Uh, at this stage, I would like to call in Lou because I think uh, Lou was the, Lou possibly wrote a paper in the British Journal in 2018 where he spoke about the extended total joint replacement of classification system. Any comments on this, Lou? Are you there, Lou? Yeah, I'm here. Um, yeah, I was going to mention that during the discussion. Uh, yeah, we, uh, again, Ross Elledge and Bernie Speculin and I um, came up with a classification for these extended devices. And the reason we did that was so that as people report nice cases like this, um, they can say that, you know, this is a, uh, an F3 because it's an extended fossa with a, uh, an, an M or mandibular component of one, which is a normal mandibular component. Um, so that we were comparing apples with apples and not apples and oranges. Um, I think one of the things, one of the, the complaints that everybody has about the literature is that we tend to lump things together. And our, our hope is uh, to start classifying these devices so that as more and more of these cases are done, we can put the right components with the right disease process to see what works and what doesn't work. Or 
let's uh, carry on then down through the case. Yeah. yeah. So the next uh, slide clearly depicting the peer view, the beautiful fit of the custom joint there. You can see the angulation, how beautifully the stock joint is well flush sitting with the ramus of the mandible. The yeah, peer view man. Oh, there yeah. is. Custom. Yeah, and that's the orthopentomogram showing us the extended F3M1 classification by Lou Mercury in his paper, fantastically written in the British Journal of Oral and Maxillofacial Surgery 2018 for the knowledge of the youngsters. And now going on to the clinical picture, uh, from the clinical perspective, we had planned for a genioplasty, but this case took a while for us. So we thought we would give her an additional time. We planned for a genioplasty as well. But the case went on for quite some time, I still remember, and we kept it at a later date. We didn't want to have an increased anesthesia time. At this stage, uh, Gary and Lou and Luke, I would like to ask one question. When we speak about surgical site infection, is it dependent upon the duration of the TMJ replacement surgery that if you don't finish it within two hours or three hours, the propensity for an infection rate would increase as spoken in the American Surgeons Association. Would that rule still apply here? Yes, absolutely. Two hours has been shown in the orthopedic literature. Surgery lasting more than two hours does is a risk factor for periprosthetic joint infection, for sure. Okay, okay. So that's how we manage this girl and uh, hopefully she's doing well with no other significant complaints. She's happy with the facial appearance, obstructive sleep apnea has improved, right. Okay, so uh, I mean, there's so many discussion points on this. We've touched on some of them already, the use of the cutting guides. Um, this uh, highlights also the use of the fossa with the posterior lip because we're advancing the mandible and repositioning it inferiorly. Um, that prevents the risk of um, uh, displacement posteriorly like Lou had, had commented earlier. Uh, one question that I would like to raise to the panelists is in a case like this where we're operating in a multiply operated site there's a lot of tissue fibrosis how much do you feel you can lengthen the ramus without encountering difficulties with soft tissue closure and so on I mean, I'll, I'll take that on um, that, that is an issue, um, you know, the, I'm sure you had to uh, uh, spend a lot of time trying to uh, extend the, uh, the ramus or pull the ramus down during this uh, press, the, during this event. Um, part of that is due to the stylomandibular ligament. Uh, I think the stylomandibular ligament is the, is the big, big uh, problem in these cases. And I've tried to figure out a good way to get to that uh, without disturbing the, the inferior alveolar bundle uh, or getting into some other sort of big bleed, um, particularly in these craniofacial cases where, as you said earlier, uh, the anatomy is, is so different. Um, and I don't know, I don't know the answer to that, but to me, that's the problem. Now, one of the things that people have done to uh, eliminate or, or get around that problem is use a distractor. And the Piero Cascone has a paper in, the, uh, in one of the journals um, that I think is craniomaxillofacial surgery where he used the uh, uh, KLS Martin uh, chicken foot thing where he distracted, uh, he opened, it was an ankylosis patient where he had to increase posterior vertical height and he opened it, did his gap arthroplasty put a distractor on because he couldn't get the device in because he couldn't just mandible enough, put a distractor on for like two or three days, okay, uh, went back and was able now to get the device in. So there are some ways to get around it, but maybe somebody has figured out a way to get to that, that ligament. It's just something that I think to consider if you're operating in a multiply operated site that there may be some limitations as to how much you can increase that vertical dimension. Just be mindful of that. Uh, I agree with Lou completely with the pterygomandibular ligament and also the sphenomandibular ligament. Um, 
Uh, Andrew, before he left, commented on the impact of the coronoid and the temporalis being a restriction to vertically lengthening the ramus. I think all three come into play. Uh, in, in my hands, the style of mandibular ligament is the easy one to get to because it inserts into the angle of the mandible on the medial side. So if there is resistance to vertical lengthening, I simply take a periosteal in and detach it. Um, the sphenomandibular mandibular ligament is the one that's closely related to the inferior alveolar uh, canal um, and foramen, so that's a bit more challenging. And the coronoid is, is easy to deal with. Uh, Luke, any comments on that? Um, I haven't got a lot of experience with that sort of thing, but what you're saying makes a lot of sense. Okay. All right, well, let's see if there are any questions from the viewers, because we're running a little bit behind and we need to move on. Any questions from the audience? Gary, can I come in with a question? Now, yes. Uh, this is regarding, uh, uh, there was a question uh, uh, differentiating between Biomet uh, custom joint and uh, TMJ concepts. Now, now that comes in because we don't get uh, TMJ concepts uh, here in India. Now, uh, there's the second part to this question. Uh, <clears throat> there are a lot of companies manufacturing joints, custom joints uh, in India now. So uh, I would like to hear from uh, Lou regarding what kind of regulations and you know how should we be looking at these joints which are probably made from industrial machines uh, and you know what should we be looking out uh, watching out for Lee would you like to take that one yeah that that you know that depends on on what your uh, what your government how your government regulates medical devices um, I think uh, it's important, number one, that these devices be tested mechanically. Um, number two, that they be tested, uh, that you have a, what, what the FDA requires here is a um, experimental study. For instance, um, for TMJ Concepts and Biomet in the United States, the FDA required uh, that we do a preclinical study uh, and that so our TMJ Concepts study was the, our 1995 paper. It was in the Journal of Oral and Maxillofacial Surgery, where we had uh, 150 patients and 300 devices or something like that. And we followed the patients for a minimum of three years. Uh, that's a requirement uh, from the FDA. Um, so I don't know what the requirements are around the world. Uh, from my uh, paper that we wrote on all the devices that are available, it appeared that there were only four countries that had uh, any kind of uh, regulation on, on medical devices. It was Brazil, the United States, um, England, or UK, and uh, there's another one. The other interesting thing about all the devices that are being made uh, around the world, uh, the vast majority of them, uh, of the 30 devices, I think uh, 24 of them are custom devices. So people are realizing that custom is a better way to go. Not that there isn't a place for the stock devices as we've been discussing for ankylosis cases, but as we're doing more and more combined TMJ and orthognathic surgery or these craniofacial type cases, people see the, the importance of, uh, of using a, a custom as opposed to a stock device. Um, so, I mean, those are, it's, it's individual countries. Now, I think individual societies um, probably should be looking at these things as well, uh, because our, our my main concern with all of this is that we're going to put devices on the market that are going to fail. And as these devices fail, we're, it's going to paint all of us who use these devices with the same brush. That somebody's going to come along and say, this is just like Proplast Teflon. See all these failures. Look at all these failures that are happening. And then the regulatory agencies are going to come down harder on everybody, which makes it difficult for patients in the long run. So, uh, you know, I don't know the answer to the question, but I do know the problem. So can I just ask, it's not only about the materials being FDA approved, right? It's about the actual manufacturing process and the porosity and all that. And that's why you suggest there should be, uh, these uh, joints should be tested on the materials per se. Yeah, 
yeah, I, <laughs> these devices these devices need to be tested mechanically before they're put in the patient's body. Uh, but you know, as I said earlier, one of the problems that we have is that we don't know the for the exact forces that are placed on these devices in a normal situation. Um, you know, there's finite element analysis studies that are done. That's fine. Um, but we need to be able to mechanically put these things on a testing device like we have in the lab and actually put them through their paces, 10 million cycles at two hertz or three hertz in order to be able to know when is this device going to uh, fail. We have to take these devices to failure because that's how you find out whether the materials are correct, whether the design is correct, and whether the implementation will be correct. Okay, thank you. All right, well, let's move on to case number five, which is a case presented by Dr. McCurry. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, this is a, uh, a young boy who uh, presented uh, with a, uh, uh, at, at age two, with a benign right TMJ chondromyxoid fibroma. Uh, he was operated at, a, at another institution. By the way, this is a case of uh, Jim Swift's from the University of Minnesota. This is not my case. Um, and it was presented in a paper that we uh, uh, published in uh, 20. 10 or something like that. Anyway, um, he underwent uh, a right uh, TMJ condylectomy at, at another institution before he presented to Jim. Patient had a recurrence one year later, had another resection, so that was surgery number two. Uh, at age seven, he presented to uh, uh, Jim with a uh, this facial asymmetry. So at age seven, he underwent a costochondrograph. Jim did a costochondrograph, which was surgery number three. Next slide. At age nine, he returned to Jim with a deviation, the overgrowth of the uh, rib graft, um, which again happens in 58% of the cases. Um, so Jim did an arthroplasty, a gap arthroplasty and a, a VRO to shorten the right side. So that was surgery number four. At age 11, he returns. His maximum incisal opening had decreased to four millimeters. Next slide. Jim did a, uh, at age 12, did a CT scan in a uh, stereolithic model, was constructed to evaluate the post-surgical right temporomandibular joint. And you can see he had not only overgrown again, but he had also developed an ankylosis. So at age 12, uh, whoops, back up, please. At age 12, uh, he did a, another gap arthroplasty and a um, rib graft, another rib graft, and a right coronoidectomy. So that was surgery number five. At age 13, he comes back. He's, his maximum size of opening has progressively decreased, and he's re-ankylosed. Next slide. Uh, Jim called me on the phone and said, is there any chance we could do a joint prosthesis on this young boy? And I said, well, you know, if the parents agree to it, go for it. And so surgery number six was a TMJ Concepts patient fitted right temporomandibular joint replacement. Next slide. So Lou, this brings up a whole discussion <laughs> really about are these alloplastic devices suitable for pediatric or growing patients specifically. Um, in the US, the FDA has not approved the alloplastic devices for pediatric use. Uh, so this is, a, um, a, this is an application that's going uh, outside the FDA approval. The issues that people often raise with children having alloplastic devices fall into two areas of concern. Number one, how long is this device going to last? And then number two, what are the implications on growth of the mandible? And that's even more important with a unilateral joint replacement, is that mandibular growth going to be asymmetric? So I think the first discussion point should be 
<clears throat> excuse me, longevity of these devices, right? So we know from concepts, the clinical track record, now we're approaching 30 years of clinical data on the concepts device without seeing repeated pattern of failures that we see with, with knees and hips at around 10 to 15 years, similar with Biomet. So the longevity, we don't really know, is this device going to last the child through a lifetime? Uh, my take on the growth issue is that um, worst scenario, the mandible does grow asymmetrically and then you require a surgery to correct it. And that surgery can be simply removing and replacing the ramal component with a longer ramal component. You can do distraction. You can even do sagittal split osteotomies because the screws are posterior to where you would make the cuts. So there are several ways to get around that growth issue if it occurs. And the other really important point that I believe people need to understand is if you're considering an alloplastic joint replacement in a child, that child's joint is a very abnormal joint to begin with, the natural joint, and therefore is not going to grow normally anyway. So what's the, uh, what do the panel feel about alloplastic devices in, in children and the potential problems? Let me address the, the off-label use of, of devices in the United States. Um, Many, many uh, devices and drugs are used off-label. It's called off-label, meaning that it's, it's not an FDA approved. Um, you as a physician can off-label use a drug or a device as long as that drug or device being used is an approved device and an approved drug, number one, and that you as a physician can justify its use without harm or, or death to the patient. So uh, off-label has a, has a caveat to it. Um, it. I'll let the other panelists talk about their uh, feelings about this uh, before we proceed. Any other comments from Luke or Abe? Because I think we'll answer some of those questions as we, as we go along. Thank you. I just happened to see Lou's paper on uh, considerations for uh, use of alloplastic TJR in uh, skeletally mature pa immature patients. I, <laughs> I must congratulate Lou. I think one of the fantastic quotes what Lou has put, uh, put across is the arrogance of success is to think that what you did yesterday will be sufficient for tomorrow. <laughs> it's a fantastic quote. I think that's for the people who are thinking from the inbox rather than the ones who are thinking out of the box. So what I would like to confer is if the child, what Lou has shown, has been operated for at least five times with different modalities of uh, treatment, and if the alloplastic TJR has given him a life so that he can move around with the younger ones, improve his quality of life, I think then alloplastic TJR is here to stay in the pediatric population. And that uh, was uh, even reinforced by Van Kampen. If you see the same article where Lou has written his review of literature, it's a fantastic article where he speaks about alloplastic TJRs being used in children and Van Kampen using the same as an uncemented prosthesis in children of older group for total hip replacements where he's compared and the other paper, what I came across is from the moderator himself, Dr. Gary Warburton, where then the study was done from the international paper of Journal of Oral Surgery 2019, where there is clear indication that the use of TJR in growing patients is a useful modality and it is a select modality in a select group of patients. I think your paper and Lou's paper complement each other, if you ask me at this stage, and, you, and I think Lou has laid down guidelines for joint replacements in children based on the requirements, whether if the child has come in with a high inflammatory arthritis or as a case, what he is presented on recurrent or fibrous or bony ankylosis and failed tissue grafts. I think Lou would agree with me where, and in children where there is a loss of the vertical, vertical mandibular height as well as an occlusal collapse. 
So basically, I'm trying to say that what work has been done for that child is definitely worthwhile considering the quality of life. That's what I would like to add. Lou, do you have any experience in pediatric patients, growing patients? No, I don't. Um, and that's sort of what I was going to say, really. I mean, I feel that the evidence is out there that it is probably the right thing to do. But I would feel probably another important message is to point out that this is super, super specialized surgery. And certainly in the UK, there might be one or two units, you know, for the whole of the UK that would be providing this sort of surgery. Those kids, those kids do deserve the best surgery in the best hands in the best unit. And it's a big team effort for that kind of good outcomes that you need. And um, that would be the message I would have for TMJ surgeons is this is super, super specialized. Yeah, yeah. So Lou, let's, let's move on. This, this case received a unilateral joint. So can you show us the consequences, if any, that this joint had on growth? Okay. Um, this is the paper. Um, there's the, the paper from 2009. Um, this was him at, you saw his, at, at age eight. He had the surgery at age uh, 13. Here he is five years later at age 18, uh, age 21, and age 23. And I think you'll notice, beside the fact that he's gained a little bit of weight, um, he's symmetrical. Next slide. Here's his maximum incisal opening at surgery at age 18, at age 21, and at age uh, 23. Next slide. And here's his occlusion. Outside of the fact that he needs his teeth cleaned, uh, his occlusion has been maintained. This is his occlusion at age 23. Next slide. So how did he grow? You know, that is the question. Uh, the question is uh, answered by Moss's functional matrix theory. Uh, form follows function. If you get these kids functioning, they grow. And as Gary said, uh, if they don't grow, uh, then it's a matter of either putting a new prosthesis in, doing some distraction, and you could even do a sagittal split because if you look at the, these devices, all the screws are behind the mandibular foramen. And uh, Larry Wolford has done uh, a few cases, uh, in fact, more than a few, of sagittal splits in patients who have had uh, these devices in place. So this is a paper um, that's going to be published in the International Journal that uh, Gary and his residents helped us uh, prepare, where we came to these considerations for the use of these devices high inflammatory arthritis, recurrent fibrosis, failed tissue grafts, because it doesn't make any sense to keep doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result. We've already talked about costochondral grafts and ankylosis. It's not a good idea. So why keep doing it? Uh, and loss of vertical dimension on and on. But the one thing that we've learned is that if you have a patient with a developmental or a congenital anomaly, those patients would not be expected to grow because they don't have a functional matrix. And in a study that we're publishing from our craniofacial unit at Rush, uh, it's going to be in the Journal of Cranial Maxillofacial Surgery, uh, we make this point that for patients with developmental and congenital anomalies who lack a matrix, don't expect those patients to grow. Therefore, we would not put these devices in those types of patients until they've matured their skeleton. And John Polly, uh, who's a well-known craniofacial surgeon here in the United States, also reiterates that point in a paper that was in the cleft palate and craniofacial journal. Um, John has gone completely to uh, alloplastic devices in skeletally mature developmental and craniofacial anomaly patients. Next slide. And here's all the references. The Moss reference is the uh, one, two, fifth one down, sixth one down. And then Wolf's Law uh, talks about the fact that the way the mandible grows is by the pull of the muscles of mastication and the muscles of facial expression and the SMAS on 
the periosteum surrounding the mandibular bone. As the patient functions, that pull causes deposition of bone on the mandible and you get resorption of the bone behind it and the mandible grows. We need many, many more, as, as, our, as, as Gary's paper uh, talks about, uh, we need many, many more uh, studies on this before we say this is the absolute way it should be done. But uh, as has been said, we need to start thinking out of the box and we need to start thinking about you know, a better way of doing things rather than staying inside the box thinking there's only one way to do these kinds of things. Great, thank you, Lou. Um, so any other comments from the panelists before you invite questions from viewers? All right, are there any questions from the audience? Terry, I think you can move on. Okay. So, Luke, um, would you mind presenting your extended TJR case? Thanks. Thank you very much. So, I um, want to present a healthy female presented referral from a dental surgeon, uh, an incidental finding of a multilocular radiolucency right mandible. Um, she had a, a biopsy which showed it was a conventional solid ameloblastoma and uh, we put the OPG up. It shows um, a lot of expansion, multilocular radiolucency in the right mandible. And then there's a CT scan as well, which I think shows it quite nicely. There we are. So, um, so there's obviously lots of choices. So I think the next thing we're going to do is discuss the treatment options. Yeah, so let's let's do that. There are many options, right? So in, in my practice, in a case like this, what I would consider as my number one uh, treatment choice is fibula flap to reconstruct the body, vertical ramus, and condyle. Um, we can now, with the uh, assistance of virtual surgical planning, have cutting guides that allow us to predictably position the fibula and go now the step further, which is to put dental implants in, all in a stage one surgery. So that's the advantage of that. And um, usually in these cases where the meniscus is preserved, there's minimal risk of ankylosis from the fibula head being up against the glenoid fossa because that is one risk when you don't have some soft tissue interface. Um, so what, are the, what, what uh, treatment options would you consider? Are they here? Uh, I would agree with you, uh, extended uh, TJR. But to add to that, I would not steal it away from Pramod. Pramod has been doing some wonderful work when you consider uh, treatment of uh, benign tumors, to be more specific with ameloblastomas, as Luke said, I think it was a solid ameloblastoma where he's considered an ETJR. Uh, I've seen Pramod's unit doing a lot of work where they've done the resection and then put in the fibula. And uh, the sag of the fibula was managed by Pramod with the novel idea of putting in a narrow, standard narrow uh, stock prosthesis along with the fossa component so that you can get that good snug fit. So the takeaway message which I could take from Pramod's unit and Pramod was that he used a narrow stock prosthesis onto the fibula so that the patient had a posterior vertical stop and you could never get that fibula falling down freely. If Pramod is there and if he can chip into this idea, excellent. I think that's a fantastic idea. In addition to what Luke has spoken about regarding the extended TJR and doing it in a single stage, I would totally agree with you. We have a case where we did the same. We did an extended TJR, but we could not get the rehab in place because uh, there were financial constraints, but we got it done from Biomet. The patient had to pay a real uh, gold money for that. But uh, I think this option from an Indian perspective of what Pramod has been doing is excellent. Gary, if you can ask Pramod to come in and just shed some light on his innovations in this particular aspect. Yeah, Pramod, yeah. like Yeah, uh, uh, what you said is right. We initially tried uh, stock joints uh, along with fibula and uh, scapula as well. But yeah. then we moved on from there to uh, extended joints. So I can come in with that once this discussion gets over uh, with Luke. 
All right, all right, all right, all right. Okay, Gary. Okay. So Take if we do what you consider yeah. as the option. So, um, so broadly speaking, the, uh, the goals of the surgery is to remove the tumor, to cure the patient of the disease. The second um, goal is to give her um, good reconstruction. So good um, function, good cosmesis. But then of course, the other concerns are, what is it gonna cost the hospital or the patient? in terms of money and time. So um, I was trained broadly for this sort of surgery that a DCIA would be my free flap of choice and I'd combine it probably, as Gary says, uh, preserve the disc and um, either mold the DCIA to try and give you some sort of vertical ramus or uh, add uh, a bit of a rib graft fixed to the DCIA to sit in the fossa. And that was the way um, you normally treat these. That has um, a lot of morbidity, that has a lot of surgical time and a lot of expense. And the truth is, even with really good cutting guides, cosmesis isn't fantastic, but it's pretty good. And a DCA gives you pretty good bone for um, uh, dental implants. Fibulas are generally quicker and a little bit easier but of course, uh, unless you double barrel them, they don't really replace a good, um, healthy mandible like this uh, lady had. Um, so you either put it in a lower border and get good cosmesis and have a really big superstructure attached to your implants, which is perfectly good option, or, or you compromise them somehow. The other option of course is resection with a free flap and a stock TMJ, which is also a nice option. Um, or, um, the section with an extended TMJR um, and then using a block graft. So take um, some ileum, attach it to the uh, alloplast at the time of surgery and put the block graft where you're intending on putting the implants. And that's my um, uh, personal choice. Then the final option of course is the extended TMJR with a free flap. That's sort of uh, also a nice option, and uh, uh, but of course it extends surgical time and uh, increases morbidity. So broadly speaking, those are the first choices. This case I'm presenting, I chose um, option number three, and I'll run through it. I've just got a slide next, just to highlight, we've already covered it anyway, really, but just to e explain what I mean by extended TMJR. And broadly speaking, you're either extending it proximally into the skull base and fossa, or you're extending it distally into the uh, mandible. And, uh, you know, we've discussed the classification. So, so for this case, I chose to remove the uh, right hemimandible with a combination of an intraoral approach and a preauricular incision, and then to use uh, intermaxillary fixation and space maintenance using um, orthopedic cement, um, which is impregnated with gentamicin uh, to maintain the space. And um, she was in rigid IMF for actually it was a little bit over three months, but it's a minimum of three months. And then when she came back from surgery, for surgery, I opened up the preauricular incision and uh, did a small submental incision and removed the um, spacer and, um, and then basically you can slide the um, alloplast in and then attach a bit of uh, iliac bone at the same time. Uh, and then I think we'll see, uh, the next picture shows the alloplast that was manufactured. Um, and then there's an x-ray, uh, next slide please, which shows the alloplast in situ. Um, you can see it's always important to extend beyond the chin point. Uh, if you end it halfway along the chin, it becomes very obvious, but if you extend it around to the other side, it gives you a good mechanical advantage, but also looks better. And you can see there's a little bit of bone here, which is adequate bone, extending uh, as far back as the six. So um, three or four implants there should give a more than enough 
mechanical support for fixed prosthesis. So that was her uh, surgical choice. There, so the next slide. So a couple of um, questions that I, that I would raise for discussion is, first one, when you're doing these extended uh, pathology cases or uh, pathology cases with extended prostheses, you often encounter the problem where you've, you've violated the oral mucosa. So now you have a potential for cross-contamination and colonization of the prosthesis with biofilm. Absolutely. Um, that's the first question that I have. And then the second question I would ask you is, do you, the, these pieces of metal are quite heavy uh, and they tend to sag down because not only have you um, uh, taken away the, the bone, but the muscle attachment both medially and laterally has also been removed. And that would not normally be the case with a joint replacement. You would still maintain medial pterygoid attachment for vertical support and the ligaments that Lou has already mentioned. Uh, so are there any design features that you can incorporate that might uh, alleviate that? Yeah, so, um, I, I mean, I think the, the absolute rule for these, to me, is you can't take the tumour out and put the implant in, in one procedure, if you've got any teeth. See, if she had no teeth, in the part of the mandible that I was resecting, then I wouldn't need to go in the mouth at all. And I could do it all through the neck and preauricular. So you can either convert it into a case where the patient hasn't got any teeth. So for example, when she had a biopsy done, I could have taken the teeth out that, uh, that are involved by the tumor, biopsied it and got primary closure of the gingiva inside her mouth. And then when I came back to do the extended joint replacement, I would have done it all through the neck. And that's a really nice option. But if you haven't done that and you have still got teeth involved, then you really need to uh, do it in stages and, and take the tumor out and close it in the mouth and not put the implant in until it's really healed during the mouth. And the reason um, you really need fixed IMF for three months is really uh, something I got from, um, a chap from Greece, Ferretti, I think his name is, and he explained the use of um, how he treats ameloblastomas in the mandible. And he uses a, he does a resection through the mouth, puts a plate on, puts a spacer in, and then wires their jaw together for three months, and then comes back, takes the spacer out through the neck and packs bone into the defect and gets fantastic results. But if you don't have that rigid IMF, then you start getting some movement of the spacer underneath the mucosa and it becomes exposed. And then you've got um, contamination of your spacing device. You then have to remove your spacing device and you're now left where you haven't got any, anything retaining the space where the jaw was. And that's really difficult surgery. I've only had to do it once, but really when you come back to put the device in, you have to open up the neck, dissect out the facial nerve to ensure you haven't damaged it and then put the uh, device in. And that's much harder. So. The key is don't get any contamination of the device by either not having any teeth or doing it staged. And then design features, um, depending on uh, the extent of the tumor, if you can preserve the pterygomasoteric sling, that's great, but really you need some sort of suspension um, to the skull base. And that's usually, um, certainly at concepts, they, they, they'll rarely let you get away with ordering one of these without saying to you, would you, they'll subtly ask you if you would like a couple of little holes in the right place to suspend it. If you haven't thought of it yourself, they'll guide you that way. And I think that's, I think that's really important. And I've certainly had at least one that's sang. Great, thank you. So I think this slide, uh, Luke, shows the design features that you use and Concepts recommends and that I use. Would you like to, talk about this yes so um you can see how uh how it's sagged and if you if you request you see the little hole um in the neck of the condyle and it and they'll make a little matching hole for you in the fossa component and i i use um 2 pds to suspend it i think that holds it long enough for fibrosis to form around it. 
And these are the, the features that I use as well, which is holes to reattach the, the pterygoid, medial pterygoid and the masseter by sutures. Yeah. I, I have this hole in mind and I just suspend it to a screw or even the, the temporarily fascia, which is exposed. Um, and again, this, this highlights this posterior lip on the uh, fossa design for uh, advancements of the mandible. Okay. Gary? Gary? Yes, Abay. One question at this stage, those apertures which Luke was speaking about for holding up the condyla prosthesis is on demand by the surgeon at that particular point or are you at will to ask them where you want the aperture to be made? So with concepts, what happens is they will suggest, as Luke said, they'll politely suggest, well, do you want to consider a hole here? And, and those sites are the, the most common places. Bit, so even yeah. if you don't ask for it, I always ask for it. But even if you don't ask for it, they will probably jog your memory and say, hey, would you like to consider this? It may not, not be a bad idea. Okay. The reason why I asked this was we used one from the biomet microfixation. And they gave me one on the posterior vertical border, just below the condylar head as a lip extension on the posterior vertical border. So as uh, Luke said, we could suspend it with the PDS to the temporalis fascia through the arch. So that's the reason I asked this, that is it on demand or is it the surgeon's discretion where he wants it to wrap around the muscle? That's the thing, yeah? Yes, it, it will be ultimately your decision. You can work with whatever company and design it in whichever way you like. Right, right. All right, Luke, take us the rest of the way through this. So this is um, showing the patient um, shortly after surgery, she's still a little bit swollen. Um, and she shows a nice IMF. So um, if we come to the final slide, I'll just summarize. Um, I think we can see a video of her in the next slide, if we may, slightly better. If we just play that video first, you'll see her. Barely see the scar. Uh, just open and close and close. And show us your teeth. Fabulous. So I, I think for someone who has had quite a big resection, she's got adequate bone for dental implants. She has had two quite short procedures. So she's had no more than six hours total surgical time. She's um, had minimal downtime in terms of impact on her life. She's been in hospital just one night each time. Um, the cost of the prosthesis is significant, but the theatre time that we've saved is enormous. I mean, a theatre costs a thousand pounds an hour to run. Um, I think she's got pretty nice function. She's got good cosmesis. She's got a slight uh, marginal mandibular branch weakness, and that's the result of the incision underneath her chin, which I've extended uh, because of the additional bone graft. And that, that um, this is only a few months after surgery, that's come back to normal. She's got adequate bone for implants. And the other thing to point out, of course, is if you don't put in something that holds the mucosa above the alloplast, there's a, always a risk if the mucosa is just sitting directly over that uh, uh, titanium, that it could, um, you could get a breach in the mucosa. Um, and, and, that, and that's a worry. So the bone, um, it, I think it's important to get implants into the bone so that it's function, so that it doesn't uh, uh, atrophy, but it, it also has a role of holding that mucosa away. So to my mind, she could have had a free flap as well as that uh, bone graft, but I don't think the bone would be any better than the graft she's got. It would have increased her morbidity and increased the expense of the surgery. So for a case like that, I don't think uh, a free flat would have added much. So that would be my argument for that surgery. And then finally, I think we've discussed about taking teeth out first. That I think is a really smart way of doing it. And I've done a few cases where the patients haven't had teeth at all, and it's definitely easier. Um, I think implants into the block graft, it could be done at the time of surgery. And, um, and then finally, um, Occasionally, uh, the resection of the tumour can reduce the soft tissues significantly. She has a bit of uh, masseteric atrophy, as one would expect, but 
over time that muscle will reattach and, and uh, return to normal. But if there's significant soft tissue loss, then um, for example, I had a case of um, a shooting uh, injury and there's a lot of soft tissue loss and we put a, um, an ALT flap in with the alloplast and that works very nicely. So um, that's really, it's really just on to a discussion. Thanks. Thanks, Luke. Um, any uh, viewer questions or discussion from the panelists? Yeah, I'd like to make a couple points. Um, first of all, um, I think we're dealing, you know, going back to the Elledge speculum uh, classification, uh, this is a beautiful case of a F0M3, where the mandibular, mandibular component has extended around to the other um, uh, mental foramen. A um, couple things about design. Um, I think whether you're doing an extended prosthesis for a disease or, or for a, a craniofacial case, um, don't expect to have the angle be exactly matching the angle on the other side. And the, the reason for that is, is these are designed to um, not reproduce completely the angle because we're afraid of uh, perforation through the skin. Um, many of these patients uh, don't have the overlying masseter muscle uh, to act sort of as a buffer between the, the metal and the, the overlying skin. So um, these are designed not to reproduce the angle of the mandible, so don't ask for that. Um, questions you always get are, can you use these devices for patients who have a resection for malignant disease who are going to undergo radiation? And uh, in the beginning, uh, we did do that, but we have now determined that's not a good idea uh, for a couple of reasons, uh, the main one being uh, scatter uh, of the of the beam of radiation. Uh, the, the optic nerve is very sensitive to uh, radiation. In, uh, number one, uh, number two is that uh, these devices uh, typically uh, have failed in in malignant disease uh, patients, uh, as have the patients. Uh, the other question would be in uh, osteoradionecrosis cases. Uh, the problem that we've seen there is that, as you all know, the, uh, the skin uh, has been affected by the radiation as well as the bone. And so that leathery skin does not make a, a good uh, cover for these devices, and they typically have eroded through. So if you have a patient that has an ORN uh, and you plan on using a device like this, uh, you should plan on some sort of a flap. Um, with vascularized tissue uh, that will cover this uh, area and provide you with better skin. And the final thing is the issue of the SAG. Um, I know you all have discussed it uh, there. Uh, certainly you can have a design uh, any way you want it. Uh, TMJ Concepts has found that the, that the hole seems to work very well. The thing that TMJ Concepts does not want you to do and unfortunately, there are pictures in the literature of this, is uh, people making a hole in the polyethylene and attaching a suture uh, to the, through that hole to the, to the hole in the, in the Ramo component. Uh, what TMJ Concepts prefers you do is avoid suspension of this uh, Ramo component from the fossa at all. Not the fossa screws, not a hole in the in the, in the fossa uh, metal mesh, but to take a, another screw and once you have aligned the device properly in the fossa, pass a suture through the hole, wrap it around the device and suspend it from a screw in either the temporal bone or the zygoma. And as has been stated, it, it only needs to be in place for about a week. Uh, so it can be a, you know, any sort of a suture doesn't have to, it should not be wire. And uh, that will hold this in place. So the, the key is not to touch the fossa. All right, yeah. thanks Luke. Any viewer questions? Gary, I have one question which has been coming up here. 
I think the question goes to Luke. Can fat grafting be done at a later stage for cosmetics after ETJR? Well, yes, it can, so long as you're confident you're not going to accidentally contaminate the uh, alloplast. Right. Okay. So, would you, Gary, you... can I get? Yes, promote. Gary, can I? Can I come in with my uh, comments that are reserved for later? So yes. uh, I'll go through this very quickly. Uh, we uh, we have a very strong plastic and reconstructive unit, and we do a lot of uh, uh, tumor surgeries for young patients. So we know that if we use only a fibula where we have taken the condyle out, they will have some residual facial deformity, malocclusion, significant deviation. So that is when we started considering uh, joint along with uh, microvascular reconstruction. And we started doing that with stock joints uh, because custom were not available. And then uh, even though it was technically very challenging, we did all our uh, mock surgery on STL models and then translated that into the uh, uh, surgical procedure. And the results were very promising. That you know, It was very good there. Uh, they had good facial symmetry, good occlusion, good function, good masticatory. They were back to eating their regular food, uh, very minimal deviation. Uh, so those were very promising. And I, I know that you raised a concern regarding uh, it being open into the oral cavity and uh, being open to uh, uh, the oral secretions. Uh, we used a lot of antibiotic uh, irrigation, uh, but then uh, the first case that we did is close to three and a half years down uh, uh, now, and we have not had infections with uh, these cases. Then we moved on to uh, uh, extended uh, uh, custom prosthesis that uh, CTAR's company is making for us now. And uh, what we do is we replicate uh, the contour of the contralateral side. And then uh, what it helps us to do is to position the fibula at a higher level in the uh, tooth bearing area so that uh, even for prosthetic rehabilitation, it is much easier and better for the prosthodontist uh, to uh, have a reduced uh, uh, height at that level. And in case this fails, in case the implant fails, we always have the fibula in position, right? So that's, uh, that's the added advantage. So that, that, that these were the points that I wanted to raise. And it's, it's only seven, six or seven cases till now in the last three years, but none of them have got infected so far. Okay, thanks, Pramod. <clears throat> Any other questions from the audience? All right, well, we're over time. So Hello, we, uh, we will discuss after the, uh, after the last case, we will discuss. There are some okay. questions. Okay, so I'll shorten this case as much as possible because we're, we're over time. Um, but this is a, another case of mine, 52 year old female that presented with left facial swelling pain and progressive reduction in mouth opening. Uh, she had undergone bilateral alloplastic TJR at another hospital in the United States. It was later revised by another surgeon a year prior to coming to see me. She developed an immediate post-op infection with, a, with purulence that was treated with oral antibiotics. She went on to develop this intermittent and ongoing left-sided facial swelling, but she didn't have any drainage. She had pain on the left and she had no other evidence at the time of uh, diabetes or known immune suppression. Here's her uh, physical exam, not really remarkable. She had a mildly elevated ESR and CRP, but no leukocytosis. Here's her CT scan <clears throat> that showed no fluid collections and the hardware hadn't failed. It was all intact and stable. So what's the diagnosis here? Let me go to, along the panel and see what people feel is the most likely diagnosis for this lady. Luke. Um, but I mean, the, the obvious, most, most common... <laughs> Uh, complication post TJR in uh, about two percent of the cases is uh, infection. Yeah. Okay. Um, Abe, what were you uh, thinking? Give that uh, history. I think I should stick with Lou. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So there's a diagnosis. Yes, it is. 
um, she had a, a late, given the fact that the, the TGR was placed years before, she had a late periprosthetic joint infection, which is now due to a biofilm. Um, so let me uh, ask Lou, you know, how, how do you go about diagnosing early versus late periprosthetic joint infections? Because I think, I think there is a, a clear difference between the two and the, the late ones that are more chronic and indolent are much more yeah, yeah, um, the The uh, early infection, my classification and the classification that's used in, in orthopedic surgery is that an early infection is one that occurs immediately postoperatively um, up to about seven days. Once you get beyond seven days, you're into what's called a late infection and you're already into a biofilm. And once the biofilm develops, there's nothing you can do other than to remove the device and start all over again. So uh, early is within the first seven days. Late is anything beyond seven days. So let me uh, just share a few slides. I'll go through these really quickly. So this is the TMJ Concepts post-market surveillance data set looking at 10,000 devices. And if you look at the reasons why they, they, these devices were removed or revised, infection is top of the list. And as Lou mentioned, it's less than 2%. Compare that to orthopedic literature uh, for knees and hips and their infection rates, they're also less than 2%. So it's 1.6% within the first year and then an increase of 0.5 between years two and 10, rounding off at about a 2% rate. So we're on par with orthopedic literature. What I alluded to was in an acute infection with a fistula that's draining pus, that's pretty easy to diagnose that as an infection. The chronic, low grade, indolent biofilm infections are much more challenging. And unfortunately, although there are all these tests listed in the orthopedic literature that can help diagnose, there is no one test that you can use that will diagnose a, a chronic biofilm infection. So we're left with using major criteria uh, for, this is for the chronic biofilm infection cases. And the major criteria, if you have one of these, then you can conclude that you have a periprosthetic joint infection. And the first one is you take a culture from two different places around the prosthesis and you grow the same organism. So phenotypically the same organism from two different cultures, or you have that draining sinus tract like that, which is very easy then to recognize. It's this case like the one I'm presenting where we've got this intermittent low grade facial swelling uh, with no draining fistulas that is more problematic because this could be infection. It could also be hypersensitivity. So we've got to figure out is this. And now we have to rely on these minor criteria that are actually um, uh, helpful in some situations. This is an expansion of that minor criteria slide. Um, this is published and an interpretation of the orthopedic literature. And you'll see some of these tests are serum, which we can do. We can do ESR, CRP, and D-dimer for sure. And I did that on this case, it was mildly elevated, although I've seen some of these TMJ infections with no elevation. And I guess that's because the prostheses are so small. But the next thing is synovial. And it's really impossible to, to harvest synovial fluid from a TMJ prosthesis. So none of these tests that are available in the orthopedic world are really helpful to us. So we've got this, this difficult time of diagnosing an infection. And the, the simple way that I look at it, if I'm trying to differentiate between an infection versus a hypersensitivity, try them on a period of antibiotics. If it's hypersensitivity, it's not going to help. If it's infection, then it will help. Stop them and the swelling will rebound. So that's what this lady ended up with. And this is the problem that we're dealing with that Lou mentioned is the biofilm. Think of this like dental plaque and it becomes colonized. Within these uh, biofilm areas, these bacteria are sequestered and shielded from the blood supply and antibiotic treatments. Therefore, antibiotic treatment will deal with all of this going on around it and suppress the infection. But these guys are still hiding away and when the antibiotics stop, 
the infection will recur. So you get this cycling intermittent swelling. Um, Lou's mentioned this already. I'll summarize this slide very quickly. Orthopedic literature uses about three or four weeks after the initial implant is placed as the cutoff. If an infection is caught early, then there is the possibility of salvaging this prosthesis with good debridement and IV antibiotics. But the success rate is still not great with failures between 24 and 71%. Once you go beyond that three to four week time point, then there's virtually no chance of salvaging the prosthesis. And then the orthopedic world, they do a gold standard is two stage exchange and replacement with a new prosthesis, which we'll look at. Uh, and even this two stage exchange with a new prosthesis isn't 100% effective with failure rates more than 20%. So periprosthetic joint infections are a real problem and it is a big burden to patients if you have to deal with it. And that's why I'm so, critical and strict about aseptic technique and minimizing the risk of cross-contamination during the placement at the time of surgery. So this is from Lou's uh, uh, text here, and it's early PGI, less than three weeks. You have a chance of salvaging. It's diagnosed by maybe by some of these things here. And you have a chance with incision and drainage and thorough debridement with IV antibiotics of salvaging it. Late infection beyond three weeks, two stage removal and replacement. That's based on the orthopedic literature. Larry Wolford looked at a series of his patients. There were, I think, eight patients in this, in this series divided into acute and late infections and using, in the acute group, using this, these two irrigation inflow cannulas and the Penrose drain as the outflow. He irrigated around here, having taken the patient to surgery, surgery and surgically debrided it, scrubbed it with a betadine toothbrush sterile, uh, and then placing these catheters, and then five days of irrigation with double antibiotic solution, which contained neomycin and polymyxin. <clears throat> and this is his protocol that he did early infection identified, ID consult, debride prosthesis scrubbed irrigation catheters every four hours irrigate with double antibiotic solution for five days. IV antibiotics via a PIC line, outpatient IV antibiotics, and then oral antibiotics for 10 days. And then if the infection had resolved, mm. fantastic, that prosthesis was salvaged. And he had an 80% 80% salvage rate with that protocol. The late protocol is explantation and replacement with a new device. <clears throat> this is my, uh, if I'm doing the two-stage surgery to explant the device, we have to maintain the space because otherwise the soft tissue will ingrow. Uh, this is what I use. It's the orthopedic bone cement containing antibiotic, tobramycin, and it's fabricated as a space maintainer. Uh, and then the patient is scanned, new device is manufactured, and six weeks later we go back and put that device in. Um, any questions at this point about, or comments from the panelists about the uh, management of joint infections and how would you go about, would any of the panelists go about diagnosing this any differently? Now, the, a couple of okay. comments. Oh, go on, Lee. Um, uh, one of the things that um, this case really shows is um, that patients who show up after revision surgery with swellings like this, the most likely cause is an infection because in the orthopedic world, if you look at, at their, uh, you know, Gary brought up the point that it's about 2%, but those are initial implantations. If you look at revisions, it can be as much as 53% infection rate. So uh, we have to uh, consider whether the patient is, has a primary uh, implant or it's a revision implant. It's more likely that it's, a, that it's an infection, biofilm infection, if it's a revision, like in this particular case. Um, number two is that it's very difficult uh, in a primary case to determine whether you're dealing with a hypersensitivity, an infection, or a reaction to uh, wear particles. Um, so you know, that's, that those are other considerations that you should make. But if you look at the statistics, it's more likely that it's an infection than a hypersensitivity, which occurs in less than 1% of our patients. 
And I think the, the point I make in most of my articles on this is that prevention is the most important thing. And the American College of Surgeons has come out with a, a prevention of, uh, of uh, surgical site infections uh, recommendations. And their recommendation is that before any implantation of a medical device, that the patient be placed on antibiotics one hour before the surgery begins. And what they mean is not one hour before um, you, know, you, you put the patient in the operating room, it's one hour before you drop the knife on the patient, um, number one. Number two is that they recommend that the surgery, and Luke brought this point out very nicely, that the surgery be as short as possible. In other words, you, you, you don't dilly-dally around. Uh, we used to call it OSFAT, uh, <laughs> obligatory surgical fool around time, you know, where you stand and talk, and the device is open. The other thing is and now with COVID, uh, I think it's really important. We, we talk about keeping as few people in the operating room as possible and that you have good airflow in the operating room. The idea of wearing spacesuits and all that other kind of stuff really has not proven to be that important. What's most important, in, and this is why you probably see when you walk around the operating rooms in your, in your, uh, in your hospital, that orthopedic surgeons do not want a whole crowd of people in the operating room when they're doing a joint replacement. And the more and more people that come in and out of the room, the more and more opportunity for them to bring in uh, organisms. And uh, uh, so uh, I think those are some important points that have to be made about prevention. Putting the patient on post-operative antibiotics, the American College of Surgeons has said that for clean surgery, that's not necessary. But if you look at the footnote in that paper, the footnote says, except for total joint replacement. Um, there were hospitals here in the United States who were preventing surgeons who are placing joints, or TM joints in patients from putting them on post-operative antibiotics uh, because of this American College of Surgeons thing that came out. But they didn't read the fine print. And so if you run into that situation, uh, I'll be happy to get you the paper. Uh, and I think it's quoted probably in some of our papers that it's absolutely important that the patient be on not only intra, uh, post-operative in the hospital antibiotics, but for at least seven to 10 days post-operatively. And that's uh, covered by the, uh, like I said, by the American College of Surgeons. So those are my comments on that. You got it. Yes, Abay. Uh, there's a question. Can late infections, let's say after two years, have bloodborne sources as in from an odontogenic infection? Yes, absolutely. So the early infections uh, are considered within a year, um, they are most likely nosocomial and the inoculation took place at the time of surgery. More than a year, certainly two years out, the, the hematological spread is, is considered by the orthopedic surgeons to be the modality of inoculation. Okay, and what is your protocol of uh, perioperative, intraoperative and postoperative antibiotic regimen, Gary, and postoperative and if patients are allergic to certain kind of antibiotics, what is your protocol, what you follow at Maryland? So a point to bring out before we talk about antibiotics is what are the most likely organisms that cause periprosthetic joint infections? And they're typically the skin organisms, Staph aureus, Staph epidermidis. There is one organism called, used to be called P. acnes. Now it's called Cutibacterium acnes. And this is a unique one because it, it doesn't grow easily in culture, yet it's responsible for a lot of periprosthetic joint infections. So in order to identify that, you can't take the culture and send it to your lab and have them incubate for only five days. It will miss it. You have to then request that you incubate for at least two weeks in order to have a chance of culturing P. acnes or now called Cutibacterium acnes. So based on the most likely organisms, that dictates your antibiotic choice. And I give antibiotics just as Lewis outlined, IV an hour before, intra 
hospital stay, IV antibiotics, and then oral antibiotics post-op. But it should be uh, an, an antibiotic that covers that profile of microbes. So a third generation cephalosporin um, should, should suffice. And uh, that's my treatment. And are you worried? This question is from the paper what Lou had uh, possibly the author, where uh, he says, uh, Post-operative antibiotic prophylaxis is important in DMJ reconstructions because of the tips of the condylar component. Those are the screws which lie in the pterygomandibular space can be contaminated by an inferior alveolar nerve block. What is your take on this? Can I respond to that? Yes. Yes, Lou. Yeah, yes. That's your paper, Lou. Yeah. Um... Yeah, you know, the, the uh, American uh, Academy of Orthopedic Surgery and the American Dental Association got together about prophylaxis for uh, the, uh, anybody who has a joint replacement, meaning mainly hips and knees. And the conclusion they came to was that um, it's up to the orthopedic surgeon and the dentist as to whether the patient gets put on antibiotics, which is one dose of antibiotic. So, and I was on that panel, but I, the thing that, that bothered me was that was for, you know, taking out teeth and, and doing a, a, a prophylaxis, you know, getting your teeth cleaned and that kind of stuff. My concern was that I saw, I've seen in my career a number of patients who develop pterygomandibular space infections from inferior alveolar nerve blocks. Uh, I think we've all, as oral surgeons, have seen something and treated it. So my concern was, if the likelihood of a pterygomandibular space infection is, is there because of an inferior alveolar nerve block, and these screw tips are right there, that's a direct connection to my prosthesis. So what I did was I advised all of my patients for two years, if they were to have an inferior alveolar nerve block, they should be prophylaxed with an antibiotic, one dose of an antibiotic for the amoxicillin. The reason I chose two years is because after two years, um, you get uh, either fib fibrous covering of those screws or you get bony covering uh, because those screws are just penetrating the uh, medial plate. They're not you know, going all the way through as we discussed before. So because I, you know, I, I felt more comfortable doing that I don't know that other people do it. And if they do, great. If they haven't, have they seen infections? It just made me more comfortable. So that's why we, we did that. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Tom. Luke, what do you do with your post op antibiotics? Um, I, they have IV antibiotics until they go home and then a change to oral, and then they have an extra five days from leaving hospital. The other thing I wanted to mention just because it's happened to me quite recently, is um, when patients get sort of a stitch abscess or superficial wound infection, that can be quite that can be quite scary because you know you could have a small little uh, uh, bit of bleeding or a little bit of pus just within the superficial wound. And how do you differentiate between that and an acute joint infection? Can I answer that? <laughs> Yeah, and um, I'll try you because I've had exactly that situation. Okay. Um, what, what I've done is um, I, I, the vast majority of those are stitch abscesses because they occur very quickly. But what I've done is I've taken a, uh, a gutta percha point, a big gutta percha point, like one you would use in a central incisor, and I pass it uh, into the, the, the sinus tract or fistula, whatever you call it. And, if, and then I take an, an image, I take a PA x-ray. And if it touches the device or it touches the fossa, that to me is a biofilm infection. And I will go ahead and, and manage it that way. That's, that's been my, my, my way of doing it. Somebody may have a better way. No, that's what I do. I, I, I probe it with gutta perca points. And if it's a suture abscess, it would be superficial. You won't get the point in very far. Um, the case that I had, uh, was um, just like that. Yeah. Any other questions from the audience or the viewers? 
yes gary what is the comment about placement of the drain tube in post operative phase does it is a source for biofilm formation i i couldn't understand the question abishal can you say that again post operatively placement of the drain tube does it cause any biofilm formation and is a source of infection in tgr tgr case so i think the question is drain placement is that correct yes y yes 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 yeah so i will only put a drain if i'm concerned of a hematoma because we know from orthopedic literature that looks at risk factors for, for, for infection hematoma is one of them so if it's an oozy site and I, i can't get good control of the hemostasis before i'm closing up then i will put a drain in but it's only in for 24 hours and it's a suction drain i don't have a penrose drain it's a suction that goes to a little uh, hand grenade like jackson pratt if the site is dry i don't use drains and uh, i just put a pressure dressing on and close everything up Any special consideration? Hundred percent. Sorry. Yeah, sorry, sorry. Please comment on the drain. Um, my concern with drains uh, is that things come out, but things also go in through it. And since we're dealing with uh, 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 skin contaminants, uh, that's that's an that's an issue uh, for me. The other issue I've had with drains. Is that uh, depending on how you do your retromandibular incision? You know, I know in Europe, and I don't know what happens in India, but in many of the retromandibular incisions that are done in Europe, they go through the parotid gland. Uh, I think if you're if you're doing TMJR surgery, you should not be going through the parotid gland. You should be lifting the parotid gland because the last thing you want is parotid secretions which are not sterile. Contaminating your wound, and if you do go through the parotid and you don't close the parotid, and even if you do close the parotid and you put a drain in, you've developed a sciatic seal, which we have seen uh, from other source, other sources. So, uh, drains are not a big uh, big. I'm not a big fan of drains, nor am I a big fan of the transparotid approach. Any other questions? Any special consideration in osteoporotic mandible while planning for TJR? For osteoporosis? Yes. Um, not really. Uh, the only considerations that I would have is: Have they taken any bisphosphonates? And then I would factor that in as a possible risk. But even in the cases that I've done that have been on bisphosphonates, I haven't seen. It's phosphonate necrosis, and it's probably because it's in the well vascularized area of the ramus, underneath the pterygoid and the masseter. What is the average life of TJR or alloplastic joint? Does any difference between stock and custom made processes? So we don't we don't know is the answer. What we have so far with concepts is thirty years of clinical use, without seeing. A pattern of failures that would suggest these devices wear out at a certain time point. We're up to 30 years. It may be that we see that failure at 35. We haven't followed it long enough. But 30 years is what we have so far, and Biomet is very close behind. I think they're around 25 years since their first device was implanted. So similar longevity. Lou, any comments there? <clears throat> Uh, no, uh, I mean I, I I have patients that are you know 30 years out and and have had had no problems, um, you know. So I think as the new devices come along, uh, they're going to have to show uh, the same sort of uh, longevity. Uh, I know that uh, uh, Gary is involved in uh, our, our 25 year old our 25 year follow up study uh, that we're going to attempt to do again. Uh, Prospective study, so it'll add more information to the literature. All right. If there are no more questions, yeah, Gary, we'll... Gary, no. one, one, one last, one last. Okay. So there was there was a question earlier when we were discussing the uh, uh, orthognathic surgery with uh, 
the craniofacial case, right? About uh, the approach and incisions. And I would put that in a different perspective as well regarding uh, patients who have had multiple surgeries and a lot of scar tissue. If you remember that girl, uh, we went through a coronal incision and a neck incision. And mm -hmm. uh, the girl had bilateral uh, facial palsy, which recovered over due course of time. So this question, uh, this uh, I, I would uh, even ask Dr. Uh, uh, Mercury to uh, give his comments on this. Uh, so in such cases, uh, would you consider uh, do extending the coronal or the preocular incision down and skeletonizing the, uh, identifying and skeletonizing the facial nerve uh, in order to protect the nerve? In craniofacial cases. Yeah, you, you and Lou both. Yeah. So my take on that is um, fibrous scar tissue in the surgical bed, the ch chance of dissecting those branches out is very difficult. Number two, to skeletonize the nerve, you have to know ahead of time where is it coming from. And as we saw in that particular case, there was an aberrant style of mastoid foramen, nowhere near where it should have been. So I think it would be difficult. Now, there's a, is there a role for nerve monitoring? I think that's one thing that you certainly can do that would reduce the risk. But you're not without knowing where the nerve is and having a scarred tissue bed, it's hard to dissect and skeletonize it, I think. But nerve monitoring is probably the best thing that we can do to minimize the risk. Yeah, I, I, I agree with, uh, with Gary on that one. I have, I have used nerve monitoring uh, I, I don't know if anybody else has, has tried that or, or used it. It's a real pain um, because even, uh, you know, even just moving the tissue around the nerve causes that to, to make a noise. So you're constantly hearing the buzzing through all of the case. So you never know whether it's just because you've touched some tissue close to the nerve or whether you're touching the nerve. So I, I think it's, 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 it's very difficult uh, very time consuming, and the result is no different. In my experience, the result was no different than just, just careful, careful surgery and advising the patient uh, of the fact that their anatomy is completely uh, different than, than anybody else's. Yeah. All right. Well, again, Gary, can I ask last question? Yes, go question. ahead. And it's a repeated question from the audience. What is the tripod stability and how to calculate the ramus fossa angulation? Say the first part again, Vishal. Tripod is stability about the when yeah. you are planning for TJR. How yeah. to calculate the ramus fossa angulation while planning for TJR? Yeah. So you're talking about stock devices, right? Because yeah. the custom device automatically built in. You don't have to worry about it. The engineers do it. Yeah. They angulate the fossa correctly, the candle head position perfectly, it's done. You're talking about the stock devices. So the tripod stability uh, requires one contact point medially and then two laterally on the uh, zygomatic process of the temporal bone. The fossa angulation sometimes, and David Suk has presented this, the angulation or Kent of the fossa varies. That can be evaluated on CT scan ahead of time. Um, it's also helpful, as Abe pointed out, to have a STL, stereolithographic model, fabricated, or even 3D print the models nowadays. That's readily available. And then you can use the fossa trials to figure out, are we gonna be able to achieve the correct orientation of the fossa and the ramus? Any additional points, Abey? Uh, as you said about the tripod stability, one contact point on the medial side and another contact point on the two aspects of the lateral portion of the zygoma. Uh, another takeaway point possibly would be to keep the orientation or the angulation of the fossa eminence prosthesis parallel to the Frankfurt's horizontal. Would you agree with me, Gary, on that? Yes. Yeah. That's my take on uh, the fossa eminence prosthesis. Okay, well, that sort of brings us Thank to the you. end of the webinar. And um, again, I want to 
thank the organizers for the invitation and the privilege of being involved in this uh, truly international webinar. And I thank my panelists for giving their time and their expertise and sharing their knowledge. And, and I hope that your family, friends and uh, loved ones stay safe and well through this coronavirus thing that we're dealing with currently. And with that, I will say farewell. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gary. Thank you, Gary. Thank you, Luke. Thank you. Just a second. Yes, wow. Gary, what we can do is I think this was, uh, this was a wonderful session in you know, so much of uh, uh, things of academic interest to anybody who is interested in TJR. I think uh, what we can do is we can share the YouTube link uh, with uh, uh, Kathy and, uh, and to the ESTMJS group as well so that it can be circulated so that anybody who missed out on this can watch uh, the same at their leisure later. Yeah, that sounds good. Yep. So, so we'll wind up in this and we'll meet for debriefing. We have shared the link on the WhatsApp group. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. Thank you, all the panelists. And thank you, all the co-hosts for this wonderful session. It is fantastic. Thank you. Freedom, we, uh, end, just, we end with... Freedom, yeah, Pame, uh, yeah, Pame, Gary, 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 Gary uh, uh, Luke, uh, Luke, everybody, there's a link posted. We will take a probably 10 minutes to have a debriefing session. All the co-hosts on Zoom and YouTube, uh, please join us uh, for the debriefing meeting. Thank you so much. Thank you. Pravin Play. Bye, all.